give the oath of office to myself and Judge Lana Myers. I, Dan Patrick, do solemnly swear. I, Dan Patrick, do solemnly swear. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. William Kenneth Paxton, Jr. William Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Submitted by the House of Representatives. Submitted by the House of Representatives. So help me God. So help me God. Now Judge Meyer. I, Lana Myers, do solemnly swear. I, Lana Myers, do solemnly swear. That I will impartially perform. That I will impartially perform. The duties of legal counsel and jurist. The duties of legal counsel and jurist. In the impeachment of. In the impeachment of. William Kenneth Paxton, Jr. William Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. So help me God. So help me God. For those in the gallery and, and again, watching online, we seldom bring out the Sam Houston Bible. We do it at inaugurations and other special occasions. And this is a very significant and serious occasion that will be in the history books. And I thought it appropriate to bring out the Sam Houston Bible, not just for Judge Myers and myself, but for each member of the Senate, the jurors. So we're going to take a few minutes instead of swearing in everyone at one time. And our clerk of the court, Patsy Spa, who I might mention has not missed a session day in 54 years, uh, is dedicated to her service. Uh, we'll present the Bible to each member. I will swear them in. Uh, you may choose to put your hand on the Bible or not. That is your decision. And we present the Bible to you. We will do it one by one, starting with Senator Blanco. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm solemnly swear or affirm. I will impartially try Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. I will impartially try Warren Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me. By the House of Representatives. By the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render according to the law. True verdict rendered according to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lamantia. Please repeat after me. I do so solemnly swear and affirm. I do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will impartially try Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General. That I will impartially try Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render and a true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Parker. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. I will impartially try Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. I will impartially try uh, Mr. Warren. Paxton, uh, Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. A true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hughes. Just 
Ready to use? Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Springer. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I will partially try. That I will partially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me. Upon the impeachment charges submitted to me. By the House of Representatives. By the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Senator Johnson. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges submitted. Upon the impeachment charges submitted. To me by the House of Representatives. To me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, sir. Senator Gutierrez. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. True verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Miles. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will impartially try. I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Swartner. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear and affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict rendered. A true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Campbell. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Nichols. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. Uh, that I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. 
on the impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict rendered. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator West. Please repeat after me, Senator. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. I, that I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton. General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Zaffarini. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges brought to me by. Upon the impeachment charges brought to me by. The House of Representatives. House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hinojosa. Senator, repeat after me, I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. The evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Huffman. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. A true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. The evidence. The evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Whitmire. This oath is being taken by all qualified jurors today on the floor who have a vote. Senator Whitmire, repeat after me. I do so solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of the State of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. On the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Representatives. And a true verdict render. True verdict rendered. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Flores. Repeat after me, I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. Submitted to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Flores. Senator Sparks. Repeat after me. 
I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges brought to me. Upon the impeachment charges brought to me. By the House of Representatives. By the House of Representatives. And a true verdict rendered. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Sparks. Senator King. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear. Or affirm. Or affirm. I will impartially try. I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., Attorney General of Texas. Upon impeachment charges brought to me by. Upon impeachment charges brought to me by. The House of Representatives. The House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Eckhart. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. Based on the law. Based on the law and the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Bettencourt. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Creighton. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Creighton. Senator Middleton. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear and affirm or that, affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Middleton. Senator Alvarado. Please repeat after me, Senator. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. And a true verdict render. And a true verdict ver render. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Alvarado. Senator Colcourse. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. A true verdict render. According to the law and the evidence. 
according to the law and evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Perry. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of the, of the State of Texas. Attorney General of the State of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. A true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hall. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. Solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. True verdict rendered. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Hancock. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I, that I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. A true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Senator Menendez. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. At Attorney General of Texas. Attorney General of the State of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. A true verdict render. A true verdict render. According to the law. According to the law. And the evidence. And the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Senator Birdwell. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will impartially try. That I will impartially try. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. The Attorney General of Texas. The Attorney General of Texas. Upon the impeachment charges. Upon the impeachment charges. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. Brought to me by the House of Representatives. To a true verdict render. And a true verdict rendered. According to the law and the evidence. According to the law and the evidence. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you, Senator. Senator Birdwell, thank you. Court reporters, would you please stand? If you'll repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will correctly transcribe and report all of the proceedings on the trial of Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr., on impeachment. So help me God. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Officers of the court, if all officers of the court who are assisting in the trial, please step next to our clerk of the court. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will impartially serve the court during the proceedings of the trial of Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. on impeachment. So help me God. And thank all of you for preparing over the last several months the Senate for today. Thank you.
For the record, I want to announce the counselors for the House of Managers. Please rise when I announce your name. Representative Andrew Murr. Representative Ann Johnson. Representative Briscoe Kane. Representative Terry Canales. Representative Aaron Gamas. Representative Charlie Guerin. Representative Jeff Leach. Representative Oscar Longoria. Representative Morgan Meyer. Representative Joe Moody. Representative David Spiller and Rep Representative Cody Basut, uh, Dick DeGarren, Rusty Harden, Justice Harry O'Neill, Brian Benkin, Jenny Brovorka, Therese Boyce, Donna Cameron, Isha Dennis, Mark Donnelly, Daniel Dutko, Aaron Epley, Ross Garber, Leah Graham, Lisa Hobbs, Laura Hollingsworth, Megan Moore, Mark White, and Jim Burrow. Did I miss anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Mr. Lewis? Armstead Lewis. Thank you, sir. And now, counselors, for the record, I will announce the, the let me get my list here. Attorney General's Counsel, please rise when I call your name. Tony Busby, Dan Cogdell, Allison Collins, Anthony Dolcefino, Amy Hilton, Christopher Hilton, Colby Holler, Caitlin Jackson, Mitch Little, Joseph Mazzara, Anthony Oso, and Judd Stone. Did I miss anyone? Thank you. You may be seated. I want to first introduce Judge Lana Myers, who is sitting next to me. She will be my legal counsel. I'm neither a lawyer or a judge, uh, so I appreciate uh, her giving of her time to be here today. Uh, she served with distinction in the Dallas area on the, as a prosecutor on a criminal court and on the Fifth Court of Appeals. So I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you, Judge Myers. Once again, good morning for those of you attending today. Just a couple of brief remarks in the gallery. All cell phones must be turned off other than the media. No recording may be made of the proceedings by those present. We must maintain decorum and no distractions in the gallery as we will on the floor at all times. We're glad to have you here, but any outburst by anyone in the gallery will result in your removal. So I hope you're with us for the whole time. Uh, our first order of business is to address 24 pre-trial motions submitted by the parties. The deadline for the parties to file pre-trial motions was August 5th. Answers to the motions from the other party were due August 15th. The rules that were written by the senators and passed 25 to three require any motion that could result in dismissal of an article of impeachment to be voted on by the members of the jury. 
the senators. There are 16 such motions that could result in dismissal of articles of impeachment. Unlike regular session, where members speak and debate on the floor, the members pass rules which do not allow questions, discussions, or debate from the floor. As you know, in a regular trial, a jury does not make public comments during a trial, and neither will this jury. After the members of the court vote on the 16 dispositive motions, I will rule on the remaining eight motions, which the rules require the presiding officer to do. It is possible that through certain votes by members of the court, some or all of impeachment could be dismissed. If the articles are dismissed, the court will enter a finding that they are dismissed with prejudice, thereby satisfying Article 15, Section 5 of the Constitution, reinstating Attorney General to office. However, if any articles remain after votes on pretrial motions, the rules require we move forward with a trial. We will now take up pretrial motions under the rules. It takes a majority of members present, that is 16 voting members, who are eligible to serve as jurors to grant a motion for dismissal. Per the rules, all motions and answers are required to be filed prior to the trial and the arguments of the counsel for both sides are contained therein. Members, you have read the pretrial motions and the answers to the motions for each motion. You will indicate on your voting form, yay or nay. A yay vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. The bailiff, as you know, will collect your votes. The clerk will then announce them, each vote and the tally. And after she has tallied the votes, I am required by the rules to confirm your vote is accurate, so I will call each of you one by one by your name, and you will rise in place and state how you voted, yay or nay. As previously mentioned, a motion is considered granted if it receives yay votes from a majority of the members present, which is 16, and who are eligible to serve as jurors. Members, we will now take up motion 22, submitted by respondent Attorney General Paxton. The motion is entitled, No Evidence Motion for Summary Judgment on All Articles of Impeachment. A yay vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your vote on the voting form. Bailiff, will you collect the votes and bring them to the clerk? Are all of the votes collected, bailiff? Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Matt. The secretary will, the clerk, I'm sorry. Ms. Spa is our secretary of the Senate. Uh, the clerk will now pull the votes at random and read them into the record. Flores, no. Eckhart, no. Whole course, yay. Betancourt, yay.
Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Inahosa, nay. Zavarini, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. Blanco, nay. Twenty four nays, six yays. I will now confirm the vote of the jury in alphabetical order. Senator Alvarado, you vote. Senator Betancourt, yay. Senator Birdwell, yay. Senator Blanco, Senator Campbell. Senator Creighton. Yay. Senator Eckhart. Yay. Senator Flores. Senator Gutierrez. Yay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Yay. Senator Huffman. Yay. Senator Hughes. Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Senator Colcourse. Senator Lamantia. Senator Menendez. Hey. Senator Middleton. Hey. Senator Miles. Hey. Senator Nichols. Hey. Senator Parker. Hey. Senator Perry. Senator Schwertner. Hey. Senator Springer. Hey. Senator Sparks. Senator West. Senator Whitmire, Senator Zaffarini, 24 nays, six yeas. The tally is confirmed. The motion is denied.
Members, we are now taking up motion nine, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion to Exclude Evidence of Any Alleged Conduct That Occurred Prior to January 2023. A yay vote is to grant the motion, and a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your voting form. Bills, please pick up the votes. Are all votes collected? Thank you, Bailiff. Clerk will pull the votes at random. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, yay. Alvarado, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zafferini, nay. Perry, yay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay.
eight yeas, 22 nays. I'll confirm the votes. Senator Alvarado? Senator Betancourt? Nay. Senator Birdwell? Nay. Senator Blanco? Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Yay. Senator Flores? Yay. Senator Gutierrez? Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Huffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Senator Johnson? Senator King? Yay. Uh, Senator Colcourse? Senator Lamantia? Yay. Senator Menendez? Yay. Senator Middleton? Yay. Senator Miles? Yay. Senator Nichols? Yay. Uh, Senator Parker? Yay. Senator Perry? Yay. Uh, Senator Swartner? Senator Sparks, Senator Springer, Aye. Senator West, Aye. Senator Whitmire, Aye. Senator Zaffarini, Aye. being 22 nays and eight yeas, the motion is denied. Members, we are now taking up motion eight submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion to Dismiss Articles of Impeachment 1 through 7 and 9 through 20. A yea voted to grant the motion. A nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your ballots. Bill, if you will collect the ballots. All ballots collected. Thank you. Clerk will pull at random and read the votes. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Wartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Zaffarini, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Hancock, 
nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, yay. Cold course, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Eight yeas, 22 nays. Members, please confirm your vote. Senator Alvarado? Nay. Senator Betancourt? Nay. Senator Birdwell? Nay. Senator Blanco? Nay. Senator Campbell? Nay. Senator Creighton? Nay. Senator Eckhart? Nay. Senator Flores? Nay. Senator Gutierrez? Nay. Senator Hall? Nay. Senator Hancock? Nay. Senator Hinojosa? Hey. Senator Huffman. Hey. Senator Hughes. Hey. Senator Johnson. Hey. Senator King. Hey. Senator Colcourse. Hey. Senator Lamantia. Hey. Senator Menendez. Hey. Senator Middleton. Hey. Senator Miles. Hey. Senator Nichols. Hey. Senator Parker. Hey. Senator Perry. Hey. Senator Swartner. Hey. Senator Sparks. Hey. Senator Springer. Hey. Senator West. Senator Whitmire, Aye. Senator Zaffarini. Aye. Eight yeas, 22 nays, the motion is denied. We are now taking up motion number six, members submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Pax, and the motion is entitled, Motion to Quash Articles of Impeachment or Grant Request for Bill of Particulars. A yay vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Mark your ballot. Bales, please collect the ballots. All ballots collected, thank you. The clerk will read the ballots at random. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, 
nay. Springer, nay. Schwertner, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Zavarini, nay. Six yeas, twenty four nays. To confirm the vote, Senator Alvarado? Nay. Senator Betancourt? Nay. Senator Birdwell? Nay. Senator Blanco? Nay. Senator Campbell? Nay. Senator Creighton? Nay. Senator Eckhart? Nay. Senator Flores? Nay. Senator Gutierrez? Nay. Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Yay. Senator, H Senator Huffman. Yay. Senator Hughes. Yay. Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Yay. Senator Colcourt. Yay. Senator Lamantia. Yay. Senator Menendez. Yay. Senator Middleton. Yay. Senator Miles. Yay. Senator Nichols. Yay. Senator Parker. Yay. Senator Perry. Yay. Senator Schwertner. Senator Sparks, Aye. Senator Springer, Senator West, Aye. Senator Whitmire, Aye. Senator Zaffrini. Aye. There being 24 nay votes and six yay votes, the motion is denied. Members, now we are taking up motion seven submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Request for a Bill of Particulars. The yay vote is a grant, is granting the motion. A nay vote is denying the motion. We're doing seven.
Anybody else pick up the votes? All votes collected. Secretary will, clerk will call the votes. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, <clears throat> Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Zaffarini, nay. Six yeas, 24 nays. Members confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Yay. Senator Betancourt? Yay. Senator Birdwell? <laughs> Senator Birdwell, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yay. Senator Blanco? Yay. Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Senator Flores? Yay. Senator Gutierrez? Yay. Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Yay. Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Hoffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Yay. Senator Johnson? Yay. 
Senator King. Nay. Senator Colcourse. Nay. Senator Lavantia. Nay. Senator Menendez. Nay. Senator Middleton. Nay. Senator Miles. Nay. Senator Nichols. Nay. Senator Parker. Nay. Senator Perry. Nay. Senator Swertner. Nay. Senator Sparks. Nay. Senator Springer. Nay. Senator West. Nay. Senator Whitmire. Nay. Senator Zaffrini. There being 24 nays and six ayes, the motion is denied. Members now taking out motion 13 submitted by the respondent Attorney General Paxton. The motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Article 1. A yay vote is, a, is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please collect the ballots. All votes counted, all votes picked up, brother. Thank you. Clerk will read the votes. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, yay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Brayton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zafferini, nay. Eight yeas, 22 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado. Yay. 
Senator Betancourt. Yay. Senator Birdwell. Yay. Senator Blanco. Yay. Senator Campbell. Yay. Senator Camp Creighton. Yay. Senator Eckhart. Yay. Senator Flores. Yay. Senator Gutierrez. Yay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Yay. Senator Hoffman. Yay. Senator Hughes. Yay. Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Yay. Senator Colcourse. Senator Lamantia. Yay. Senator Menendez. Yay. Senator Middleton. Yay. Senator Miles. Yay. Senator Nichols. Yay. Senator Parker. Yay. Senator Perry. Yay. Senator Swerdner. Senator Sparks. Senator Springer. Yay. Senator West. Yay. Senator Whitmire. Yay. Senator Zaffarini. Yay. There being 22 nays and eight yeas, the motion is denied. Members, you have nine more to vote on. Members, we're taking up motion 14, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Article 2. You may pick up the motion. All votes collected, thank you. Clerk will call out the votes. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, yay. Full course, yay. Betancourt, yay. Brayton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Wartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zaffarini, nay.
eight yeas, 22 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Yes. Senator Bencourt? Yay. Senator Birdwell? Yay. Senator Blanco? Yay. Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Yay. Senator Flores? Yay. Senator Gutierrez? Yay. Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Yay. Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Huffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Yay. Senator Johnson? Yay. Senator King? Yay. Senator Colcourse? Yay. Se Senator Lamantia? Senator Menendez? Hey. Senator Middleton? Hey. Senator Miles? Hey. Senator Nichols? Hey. Senator Parker? Hey. Senator Perry? Senator Schwertner? Hey. Senator Sparks? Hey. Senator Springer? Hey. Senator West? Hey. Senator Whitmire? Hey. Senator Zaffrini? Hey. There being 22 nay votes, eight yay votes, the, mission is, the motion is denied. Members, we are now taking out motion 15 submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Article 3. A yea vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please pick up the votes. All votes collected, Secretary Clerk will call out the vote. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Nahosa, nay. Zavarini, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. 
Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. Ng, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Seven yeas, twenty three nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Nay. Senator Betancourt? Nay. Senator Birdwell? Nay. Senator Blanco? Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Nay. Senator Eckhart? Nay. Senator Flores? Nay. Senator Gutierrez? Nay. Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Huffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Yay. Senator Johnson? Yay. Senator King? Yay. Senator Colcourse? Senator Lamantia? Yay. Senator Menendez? Yay. Senator Middleton? Yay. Senator Miles? Yay. Senator Nichols? Yay. Senator Parker? Yay. Senator Perry? Yay. Senator Swartner? Yay. Senator Sparks? Yay. Senator Springer? Yay. Senator West? Yay. Senator Whitmire? Nay. Senator Zaffarini? Nay. 23 nay votes, 7 yay votes. The motion is denied. Members, we're now taking up motion 16, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Article 4. A yay vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your ballot. Please pick up the ballots. All ballots collected. The clerk will read the votes. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Barry, nay. Kulkorst, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay.
Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Wartner, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zafferini, nay. Six yeas, 24 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado. Yes. Senator Betancourt. Yes. Senator Birdwell. Yes. Senator Blanco. Senator Campbell. Yes. Senator Creighton. Yes. Senator Eckhart. Yes. Senator Flores. Yes. Senator Gutierrez. Yes. Senator Hall. Yes. Senator Hancock. Yes. Senator Hinojosa. Yes. Senator Huffman. Yes. Senator Hughes. Senator Johnson, yes. Senator King, yes. Senator Colcourse, yes. Senator Lamatia, yes. Senator Menendez, yes. Senator Middleton, yes. Senator Miles, yes. Senator Nichols, yes. Senator Parker, yes. Senator Perry, yes. Senator Swartner, yes. Senator Sparks, yes. Senator Springer, yes. Senator West, yes. Senator Whitmire, yes. Senator Zaffarini. Yes. 24 nay votes, 6 yay votes, the motion is denied. Members, we're now taking out motion 11, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Pax, and the motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Article 5. A yay vote is to grant the motion, and a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your balance. Please collect the ballots. All ballots collected. The clerk will read the votes. Flores nay. Johnson nay. Springer nay. Schwartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, Nay. Zafferini, nay. Blanco, nay. 
Bamantia, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, yay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Brayton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, Nay. Eight yeas, twenty two nays. Confirming your vote, Senator Alvarado. Nay. Senator Bentoncourt. Senator Birdwell. Nay. Senator Blanco. Senator Campbell. Yay. Senator Creighton. Nay. Senator Eckhart. Nay. Senator Flores. Nay. Senator Gutierrez. Nay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Nay. Senator Huffman. Nay. Senator Hughes. Nay. Senator Johnson. Nay. Senator King. Nay. Senator Colcourse. Nay. Senator Ramatia. Nay. Senator Menendez. Senator Middleton, Nay. Senator Miles, Nay. Senator Nichols, Nay. Senator Parker, Nay. Senator Perry, Nay. Senator Schwertner, Nay. Senator Sparks, Nay. Senator Springer, Nay. Senator West, Nay. Senator Whitmire, Nay. Senator Zaffarini, Nay. 22 nays, 8 yeas, the motion is denied. Members now take up motion 17 submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Pax, and the motion is entitled motion to dismiss Article 6. The A vote is to grant the motion, and A vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your voting form. This is motion 17, Counselor. Motion 17. If you cannot hear, let me know. Both sides, if you cannot hear clearly, let me know. Please collect the votes. All ballots collected. Clerk will read the vote. Perry, yay. Cold course, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. 
Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, yay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Shortner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zaffarini, nay. Nine yeas, 21 nays. Confirming your vote, Senator Alvarado? Yay. Senator Betancourt? Yay. Birdwell? Yay. Senator Blanco? Yay. Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Yay. Senator Flores? Yay. Senator Gutierrez? Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Yay. Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Huffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Yay. Senator Colcourse. Senator Ma La Mantilla. Yay. Senator Menendez. Yay. Senator Middleton. Yay. Senator Miles. Yay. Senator Nichols. Yay. Senator Parker. Yay. Senator Perry. Yay. Senator Swartner. Yay. Senator Sparks. Yay. Senator Springer. Yay. Senator West. Yay. Senator Whitmire. Yay. Senator Zaffrini. Yay. 21 nay votes, nine yay votes. The motion is denied. We're now taking up motion 18 submitted by the respondent attorney general Pax and the motion is entitled motion to dismiss eight article eight excuse me a yay vote is to grant the motion a nay vote is to deny the motion please mark your ballot Mark the ballots, please. Members, we would normally take a break about this time, but we will continue. We have four more motions, and then I have my eight motions, which will not take as long to announce, and then we'll take a break at that point. And after that point, we will come back and begin the trial.
Well, that was in. Thank you. Clerk will read the votes. Ken Conk, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, yay. Hall, yay. Perry, yay. Oakhorst, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, yay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, yay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Bringer, nay. Shortner, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmire, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zapparini, nay. Ten yeas, twenty nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Nay. Senator Betancourt? Yes. Senator Birdwell? Yay. Senator Blanco? Senator Campbell. Yay. Senator Creighton. Yay. Senator Eckhart. Yay. Senator Flores. Yay. Senator Gutierrez. Yay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Yay. Senator Hanahosa. Yay. Senator Hoffman. Senator Hughes. Yay. Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Yay. Senator Colcourse. Yay. Senator Lamantia. Yay. Senator Menendez. Yay. Senator Middleton. Yay. Senator Miles. Yay. Senator Nichols. Hey. Senator Parker, hey. Senator Perry, hey. Senator Swartner, hey. Senator Sparks, hey. Senator Springer, hey. Senator West, hey. Senator Whitmire, hey. Senator Zaffrini. Hey. There being 20 nays and 10 yeas, the motion is denied. We are now taking up motion 19, 19, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Pax, and the motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss Articles 7 and 15. A yay vote is to grant the motion, and a vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your ballots. You may collect the ballots.
all ballots collected. The clerk will call the vote. Senator Blanco, no. Senator La Mantilla, no. Senator Parker, yay. Senator Hughes, nay. Senator Miles, nay. Senator Gutierrez, nay. Senator Johnson, nay. Senator Springer, nay. Senator Schwartner, yay. Senator Campbell, yay. Senator Nichols, nay. Senator West, nay. Senator Whitmer, nay. Senator Huffman, nay. Senator Hinojosa, nay. Senator Zapparini, nay. Senator Hancock, nay. Senator Menendez, nay. Senator Birdwell, nay. Senator Hall, yay. Senator Perry, yay. Senator Colcourse, yay. Senator Betancourt, yay. Senator Creighton, yay. Senator Middleton, nay. Senator Alvarado, nay. Senator Eckhart, nay. Senator King, nay. Senator Sparks, yay. Senator Flores, Nay. Nine yeas, twenty one nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado. Yay. Senator Betancourt. Yay. Senator Birdwell. Yay. Senator Blanco. Yay. Senator Campbell. Yay. Senator Creighton. Yay. Senator Eckhart. Yay. Senator Flores. Yay. Senator Gutierrez. Yay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Yay. Senator Hoffman. Yay. Senator Hughes. Yay. Senator Johnson. Yay. Senator King. Yay. Senator Colcourse. Yay. Senator Lamantia. Yay. Senator Menendez. Yay. Senator Middleton. Yay. Senator Miles. Yay. Senator Nichols. Yay. Senator Parker. Yay. Senator Perry. Senator Swerdner, okay. Senator Sparks, okay. Senator Springer, okay. Senator West, okay. Senator Whitmire, okay. Senator Zaffarini. Okay. There being 21 nays, nine yeas, the motion is denied. We're now taking up motion 20. Submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Pax, the motion is entitled, Motion to Dismiss Articles 9 and 10. A yay vote is a grant to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your vote on your voting form. Please pick up the ballots. All votes collected. 
clerk will read the vote. King, nay. Sparks, nay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. La Mantilla, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, nay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zaffarini, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Terry, nay. Colcourse, yay. Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. Six yeas, 24 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Yay. Senator Bencourt? Yay. Senator Birdwell? Yay. Senator Blanco? Yay. Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Yay. Senator Flores? Yay. Senator Gutierrez? Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Senator Hanahosa? Yay. Senator Huffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Yay. Senator Johnson? Senator King? Yay. Senator Colcourse? Senator, Senator Lamantia, Senator Menendez, Senator Middleton, Senator Miles, Senator Nichols, Yay. Senator Parker, Yay. Senator Perry, Senator Perry, Senator Perry, nay, we can't hear you. So. Senator Schwartner, Senator Sparks, Yay. Senator Springer, Yay. Senator West, Yay. Senator Whitmire, Senator Zaffarini. 24 nay votes, six yay votes. The motion is denied. We're now taking up motion 21, submitted by the respondent. Attorney General Paxson, the motion is entitled Motion to Dismiss or Hold in Abeyance, Article 16 through 20. A yay vote is to grant the motion, a nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your ballot.
Please pick up the boats. Members, you have one more motion after this to rule on, and then I will rule on my eight pretrial motion. Yes. Pardon? Senator West, do you want to approach the bench or the clerk? You may come up. You may read the votes. Okay. Colcourt, yay. Johnson, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, yay. Springer, nay. West, nay. Wertner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Zafferini, nay. Betancourt, yay. Brayton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. King, nay. Sparks, yay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. Lamantia, nay.
Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Nine yeas, 21 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado? Yay. Senator Birdwell. I'm S Senator Birdwell, go ahead. I called you. Yay. Senator Bencourt. Yay. Senator Blanco. Yay. Senator Campbell. Yay. Senator Creighton. Yay. Senator Eckhart. Yay. Senator Flores. Yay. Senator Gutierrez. Yay. Senator Hall. Yay. Senator Hancock. Senator Hinojosa. Yay. Senator Hoffman. Yay. Senator Hughes. Senator Johnson, Yay. Senator King, Yay. Senator Colcourse, Yay. Senator Lamantia, Yay. Senator Menendez, Yay. Senator Middleton, Senator Miles, Yay. Senator Nichols, Yay. Senator Parker, Yay. Senator Perry, Yay. Senator Schwertner, Yay. Senator Sparks, Yay. Senator Springer, Yay. Senator West, Yay. Senator Whitmire, Yay. Senator Zafferini. 21 nays, nine yeas, the motion is denied. Members, this is your last motion to take up. This is motion number 10, submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion to Exclude Evidence Gathered in Violation of the Law. A yay vote is a grant to grant the motion. A nay vote is to deny the motion. Please mark your ballot. Please pick up the ballots. All ballots collected, the clerk will call out the votes. King, nay. Sparks, yay. Flores, nay. Blanco, nay. Lamantia, nay. Parker, yay. Hughes, nay. Miles, nay. Gutierrez, nay. Johnson, nay. Springer, nay. Schwartner, yay. Campbell, yay. Nichols, nay. West, nay. Whitmer, nay. Huffman, nay. Hinojosa, nay. Saverini, nay. Hancock, nay. Menendez, nay. Birdwell, nay. Hall, yay. Perry, nay. Colcourse, yay. 
Betancourt, yay. Creighton, yay. Middleton, nay. Alvarado, nay. Eckhart, nay. Eight yeas, 22 nays. Confirming the vote, Senator Alvarado. Senator Betancourt? Yay. Senator Birdwell? Yay. Senator Blanco? Senator Campbell? Yay. Senator Creighton? Yay. Senator Eckhart? Yay. Senator Flores? Senator Gutierrez? Yay. Senator Hall? Yay. Senator Hancock? Senator Hinojosa? Yay. Senator Hoffman? Yay. Senator Hughes? Yay. Senator Johnson? Yay. Senator King? Yay. Senator Colcourse? Yay. Senator Lamantia? Yay. Senator Menendez? Senator Middleton? Senator Miles, nay. Senator Nichols, Senator, Senator Parker, nay. Senator Nichols was nay, I didn't mean to speak over you. Uh, Senator Perry, Senator Schwartner, nay. Senator Sparks, nay. Senator Springer, nay. Senator West, nay. Senator Whitmire, nay. Senator Zaffrini. Being 22 nays and eight yeas, the motion is denied. Members and those in the gallery and watching, the senators uh, voted on the rules 25 to 3, and part of those rules uh, say that all other pretrial motions shall be ruled on by uh, the presiding officer, which is myself. I'll begin with motion 2, submitted by the House Board of Managers. Uh, this motion is entitled, Motion to Clarify Certain Senate Rules Governing the Impeachment Trial of Warren Kenneth Paxton, Jr. This motion was partially addressed by my August 9th exhibit production order. Additionally, the manager's request for clarification on timing has been addressed through an agreement of the parties last week. For those watching, I'll clarify the timekeeping for the trial moving forward. There has been much discussion on the impeachment rule especially number 17 on time limitations. Each side of the House managers and the Attorney General Paxton has one hour for opening statements, 24 hours for presentation of evidence, one hour for rebuttal evidence, and one hour for final arguments. That's a total of 27 hours for each side. Both parties, the managers, and Attorney General Paxton are in agreement on this issue, which pleases the court. Managers in this motion, you state, at a minimum, you seek clarification that the time spent by an opposing party on cross-examination will be counted only against the party conducting the cross-examination. Attorney General Paxton's team, you responded that time spent questioning a witness, whether via direct or cross-examination, is charged against the side conducting the questioning. Based on your agreement of last week, this is how the clock will run. For example, house managers, when you call a witness, any direct questioning of the witness counts against your 24 hours. When Paxson's team questions the witness on cross, time will be counted against your clock. I also want to note that the clock will keep running through routine objections. However, if I find that it's being abused by either side, I can always use my discretion to give back the time to the other party. To summarize, so we're clear what everyone has agreed to, both parties have a total of 24 hours for presentation of evidence, which includes direct, cross-examination, redirect, and recross. Anytime a party questions a witness, whether by a direct cross, redirect, recross, the clock will continue to run. And again, in addition to the 24 hours, each party has one hour for opening statements, if they choose to make those, one hour for rebuttal, and one hour for closing arguments. I've also told both sides, if they do not use the full hour allotted for their opening statement, 
Any remaining time will be added to their 24 hours for presentation of evidence. For example, if one side only uses 30 minutes, they will have 24 and a half hours of time. Finally, managers requested to change the rules regarding the use of wireless mobile devices. A rule change must be submitted in writing during trial and requires a 24-hour lay layout period. Accordingly, this motion has been addressed and no further action shall be taken. Now I will take up motion 24 submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion to Compel Discovery from House Managers. This motion was addressed by my July 12th discovery order and August 9th exhibit production order. Therefore, no further action on this motion will be taken. Now I'll take up motion 12 submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion to Exclude Inadmissible, inadmissible Evidence. This addresses the issue of political contributions. Because this information is readily available for the Texas Ethics Commission for everyone to read, this motion is denied. Now I will take up motion 23 submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxson. The motion is entitled, Motion for Notice of Brady Material and Notice of Trial Exhibits. The motion was addressed by my July 12th discovery order and August 9th exhibit production order. Accordingly, no further action is needed on this motion. Now we'll take up motion three submitted by the House Board of Managers. The motion is entitled Request to Clarify the July 12th Discovery Order or alternatively, Motion for Protective Order regarding documents produced to Warren Kenneth Packton Jr. pursuant to the Senate July 12th Discovery Order. This motion was addressed by my July 20th reiteration of the orders of the court. Accordingly, no further action on this motion. Now I will take a motion one submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxton. The motion is entitled Motion for Pretrial Scheduling Order or Pretrial Conference. This motion was addressed by my July 12th discovery order and August 9th exhibit production order. Accordingly, no further action is needed. Now I will take up motion four submitted by the respondent, Attorney General Paxton. The motion is entitled Motion to Preclude Attorney General Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. from being compelled to testify. This court notes that many factors and circumstances in this proceeding lean more on criminal in nature. The rules require a standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, which is reserved for criminal cases. Exculpatory evidence was required to be produced consistent with criminal cases. The rules require a plea to the court to be guilty or not guilty, which are the pleas exclusively used in criminal cases. Judgments of the court of impeachment are entered as acquittal or conviction, which are operative terms for judgments in criminal cases. And the House of Managers have repeatedly compared the actions of the House of Representatives to a grand jury as they preferred the articles of impeachment Grand juries are utilized only in criminal cases. Therefore, the motion is granted. The Attorney General cannot be compelled to testify. This is consistent with the reasoning and judgment in the United States Supreme Court, Boyd versus the United States. The court's ruling is clear. You may not call the Attorney General as a witness. Finally, I will take up motion five by respondent Attorney General Pax, and the motion is entitled Motion Challenging Jurors for Cause. That motion is denied. Uh, to both parties, uh, what we will do at this point is, and to the members, it's a little odd today because we have a break coming close to the lunch break. So we'll take a short 10 minute break at this one because we're gonna break around 12.15 for lunch. We'll take a 10 minute break be back in 10 minutes. Before you leave, wait a minute, I haven't dismissed you yet, okay? To both parties, when we come back, I'll have a short statement about the rules. Uh, then we will read the articles of impeachment. Attorney General Paxton will be asked how you plead after each article. And then we will uh, swear in witnesses, those who are here, and then we will break for lunch. And after lunch will be when the opening statement for those parties that choose to make that will be given. So that's the schedule. It's 11.20, be back on the floor, ready to go at 11.30. Thank you.
Jury, please take your seat. Members, please take your seats. Members, now that we are moving forward based on the pretrial motions, I'd like to comment on a several of the key rules and procedures for the trial, particularly so we are totally transparent for the public and that everyone knows what is about to happen. First, the Texas Constitution and the law require the Senate to receive articles of impeachment preferred by the House of Representatives and try them in the Senate. For the general public, the articles of impeachment are the charges brought by the House. The Senate is committed to conducting a fair and impartial trial where eligible senators will serve as jurors. We will start each day at 9 a.m. and continue until at least 6, possibly a bit later. Of course, today we started on Tuesday because of the holiday, but next week it will be Monday through Friday and potentially could go to Saturday next week. We will not do Saturday this week. We will break probably every 90 minutes or so uh, for the jurors and the parties uh, to stretch. We'll do it for 20 minutes and we'll be timely and come back. We'll break for lunch about 12.15 most days for 45 minutes till one. And then we will come back for the afternoon. I'd like to place a couple of things on the record. Officially, the parties have agreed to provide the court and the opposing party with 24 hours of advance notice on witnesses. They plan to call to testify, is that correct? Both sides? Thank you. Additionally, the party said they would agree to the admissibility of certain exhibits. Is that correct? Yes. Hold on one second, we cannot hear. Is that mic on? Well, we got, thank you, Your Honor, I apologize. Start, start at the beginning, start it's, at the beginning. It's a good trial run of screwing up on the technology. Um, I think, uh, as what I said was Mr. Busby suggested last Wednesday that we uh, decide to get together and agree what could be pre-admitted. We thought that was a great idea. The president thought so, and we assumed that's what was gonna happen. On Thursday, we were asked, would we uh, what our position was about their exhibits. And we said we would agree to pre-admit all of their exhibits. They could put in anything we wanted that was on their witness list and we would not object. They wrote back, they came back and said, is that a precondition? And I said, no, that is our, our position. You can, we will not object to any of your exhibits. Now, what is your position about ours? We'll get back to you. We didn't hear, we didn't get back. And finally, they wrote back and said, we will not agree to pre-admit any of your exhibits. So that means, in light of what the court said earlier, um, by the way, do I say court or what do I say? I, I, can handle, I can handle Mr. President, but I don't know what to refer to the facility. Court is fine. Thank you. Um, what that means is that anytime they seek to introduce an exhibit, it's gonna come in unobjected to because that was the word we gave them. When we seek to introduce any exhibit, there may be continued objections which are going to slow it down. And so I welcome the, the, uh, the court's observation that if that starts taking away somebody's time unfairly, the court has the ability to, to acknowledge that. And I'm just simply asking at this stage, no action on the part of the court, but an awareness is we thought we were playing fair with what they got in here and represented to you, and we're not taking our word back. These guys wouldn't even negotiate it with us. They wouldn't even talk to us about We'll, we'll agree to some, we won't agree to others. I, I stand up as a matter of privilege and a House of Privilege or Senate of Privilege. I just want the court to know, no, we did not have an agreement on pre-admission. 
Any response? We'll take a look at them and we'll object if it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate, we will not object. We'll do it like we're supposed to do it. Thank you, Your Honor. I've heard you both, okay? I've heard both. Uh, members, if you're watching at home, also know that you may attend in person if you wish. Um, go to senatetexas.gov for public access guidelines and more information in case you're watching at home and want to come in person. I want to remind the jurors and everyone watching that the juror senators may not consider any evidence unless taken under oath in this chamber. Their decision, your decision, must only be based on the facts and evidence presented here in this chamber and by considering the credibility of the witnesses testifying here and here only under oath. No evidence whatsoever outside of this chamber shall be considered for any purpose. This includes anything said in the House impeachment proceedings where no testimony was given under oath. Senators cannot consider anything reported in the news, anything on social media, or anything they have been told by anyone outside of this trial in this chamber, only what you hear under oath testified to in this court and your belief in those who are testifying. Senate jurors may only consider evidence given under oath in this chamber as you are the sole determiners of the credibility of the witnesses called to testify. One unique aspect of this proceeding is that one senator is the spouse of the accused. The senators adopted rules that make the spouse of the accused ineligible to vote as a juror. They could find no instance where a spouse of any defendant in any type of trial was allowed to be a juror. However, even though Senator Paxton cannot vote, the threshold to convict remains the same. The members kept the threshold at two-thirds of 31 senators, which would still require 21, even though only 30 members are voting. So the threshold is still 21 votes. At the end of the trial, the members will deliberate in private, as any jury would. To be clear, the presiding officer, I do not have a vote on guilt or innocence. I will not give any member my opinion on how they should vote. In deliberations, the senator jurors will consider it the following. Did the House managers prove beyond a reasonable doubt any article of impeachment against Attorney General? And if so, shall that article be sustained, which would result in removal from office? Therefore, it's a two-part question. Even if a member believes the House managers have proven an article beyond a reasonable doubt, the member may only sustain the article if they also believe Attorney General Paxton should be removed from office based on that article. If any one of the 16 articles is sustained against Attorney General Paxton, he'll be removed from office. The jury would then vote one last time on whether he can hold public office again if that were to occur. Members at home watching, if you wish to read the 31 rules voted 25 to 3 by the senators which govern this trial in more detail, they are posted on our website. These are just a few of the rules that will guide this trial, but I hope my statements today clarify some questions that the public may have had or have. After I swear in witnesses who are present, each party may make an opening statement and after the articles are read, uh, the impeachment articles are read. With that, Attorney General Paxson, please rise. Clerk, 
Please read the articles of impeachment, one at a time, preferred by the House of Representatives. Articles of impeachment. Article 1, disregard of official duty, protection of charitable organization. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton violated the duties of his office by failing to act as public protector of charitable organizations as required by Chapter 123, Property Code. Specifically, Paxton caused employees of his office to intervene in the lawsuit brought by the Roy F. and Joanne Cole Mitt Foundation against several corporate entities controlled by Nate Paul. Paxton harmed the Mitt Foundation in an effort to benefit Paul. Senator Paxton, how do you plead? Attorney General Ken Paxton is innocent and therefore pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. Article 2, disregard of official duty, abuse of the opinion process. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official power to issue written legal opinions under subchapter C, chapter 402, government code. Specifically, Paxton caused employees of his office to prepare an opinion in an attempt to avoid the impending foreclosure sales of properties belonging to Nate Paul or business entities controlled by Paul. Paxton concealed his actions by soliciting the chair of a Senate committee to serve as straw requestor. Furthermore, Paxton directed employees of his office to reverse their legal conclusion for the benefit of Paul. Those allegations are plead? untrue. Therefore, he pleads not guilty. I didn't mean to step on you. You want to repeat that? The allegations that I just heard are untrue. Therefore, Ken Paxton pleads not guilty. Thank you. Article 3, disregard of official duty, abuse of the open records process. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official power to administer the Public Information Law, Chapter 552, Government Code. Specifically, Paxton directed employees of his office to act contrary to law by refusing to render a proper decision relating to a public information request for records held by the Department of Public Safety and by issuing a decision involving another public information request that was contrary to law and applicable le legal precedent. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Everything she just said there was false. Therefore, Attorney General Ken Paxton pleads not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 4, disregard of official duty, misuse of official information. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official power to administer the public information law, Chapter 552, Government Code, specifically, Paxton improperly obtained access to information held by his office that had not been publicly disclosed for the purpose of providing the information to the benefit of Nate Paul. Attorney General, how do you plead? Your Honor, those are all untrue. Therefore, Ken Paxton pleads not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 5, disregard of official duty engagement of CAMIC. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official powers by violating the laws governing the appointment of prosecuting attorneys pro tem. Specifically, Paxton engaged Brandon Kamick, a licensed attorney, to conduct an investigation into a baseless complaint during which Kamick issued more than 30 grand jury subpoenas in an effort to benefit Nate Paul or Paul's business entities. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? The Attorney General is innocent and therefore pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. Article 6, disregard of official duty, termination of whistleblowers. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton violated the duties of his office by terminating and taking adverse personnel action against employees of his office in violation of this state's whistleblower law, Chapter 554, Government Code. Specifically, Paxton terminated employees of his office who made good faith reports of his unlawful actions to law enforcement authorities. Paxton terminated the employees without good cause or due process and in re retaliation for reporting his illegal acts and improper conduct. Furthermore, Paxton engaged in a public and private campaign to impugn the employees' professional reputations or prejudice their future employment. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Everything she said there, sir, is legally and factually incorrect, and therefore, Attorney General Ken Paxton pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. 
Article 7, Misapplication of Public Resources, Whistleblower Investigation and Report. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused public resources entrusted to him. Specifically, Paxton directed employees of his office to conduct a sham investigation into whistleblower complaints made by employees whom Paxton had terminated and to create and publish a lengthy written report containing false or misleading statements in Paxton's defense. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? The allegations she just referenced are untrue, therefore the Attorney General pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. Article 8, Disregard of Official Duty Settlement Agreement. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official powers by concealing his wrongful acts in connection with whistleblower complaints made by employees whom Paxton had terminated. Specifically, Paxton entered into a settlement agreement with the whistleblowers that provides for payment of the settlement from public funds. The settlement agreement stayed the wrongful termination suit and conspicuously delayed the discovery of facts and testimony at trial to Paxton's advantage, which deprived the electorate of its opportunity to make an informed decision when voting for Attorney General. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? The Attorney General is innocent of those charges and pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. Article 9. Constitutional bribery, Paul's employment of mistress. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton engaged in bribery in violation of Section 41, Article 16, Texas Constitution. Specifically, Paxton benefited from Nate Paul's employment of a woman with whom Paxton was having an extramarital affair. Paul received favorable legal assistance from or specialized access to the Office of the Attorney General. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Those allegations are flat out false. The Attorney General pleads not guilty. The clerk will read the next article. Article 10, constitutional bribery, Paul's providing renovations to Paxton home. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton engaged in bribery in violation of Section 41, Article 16, Texas Constitution. Specifically, Paxton benefited from Nate Paul providing renovations to Paxton's home Paul received favorable legal assistance from or specialized access to the Office of the Attorney General. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Those allegations are offensive and false. The Attorney General pleads not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 15, false statements in official records, whistleblower response report. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton made false or misleading statements in official records to mislead both the public and public officials. Specifically, Paxton made or caused to be made multiple false or misleading statements in the lengthy written report issued by his office in response to whistleblower allegations. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? I stand by that report and therefore plead not guilty. Your Honor, objection is simply that if he wants to take the stand and testify, we'll be welcome that. But otherwise, it's supposed to be a plea from the client. He can enter a plea of not guilty for his client. He can't make speeches as he's doing now, and I object. I ask that he just be instructed to plead not guilty or guilty, whichever he chooses, but not to be making speeches through his lawyer. Uh, sustained. Clerk will read the next charge. Article 16, conspiracy and attempted conspiracy. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton acted with others to conspire or attempt to conspire to commit acts described in one or more articles. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Absolutely not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 17 misappropriation of public resources. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton misused his official powers by causing employees of his office to perform services for his benefit and the benefit of others. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Again, Your Honor, not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 18, their election of duty while holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton violated the Texas Constitution, his oaths of office, statutes, and public policy against public officials acting contrary to the public interest by engaging in acts described in one or more articles. Attorney General, how do you, Paxton, not, how do you plead? Not guilty. Clerk will read the next article. Article 19, unfitness of, for office. 
while holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton engaged in misconduct, public, private or public, of such character as to indicate his unfitness for office as shown by the acts described in one or more articles. Attorney General, how do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Clerk will read the following article. Article 20, Abuse of Public Trust. While holding office as Attorney General, Warren Kenneth Paxton used, misused, or failed to use his official powers in a manner calculated to subvert the lawful operation of the government of the state of Texas and obstruct the fair and impartial administration of justice, thereby bringing the office of Attorney General into scandal and disrepute to the prejudice of public confidence in the government of this state, as shown by the acts described in one or more articles. Attorney General Paxton, how do you plead? Your Honor, the Attorney General is innocent and we plead not guilty. You may be seated. Bailiff, do we have witnesses to be sworn in? Please bring them into the court. Bailiff, are these the only witnesses in the building to be sworn in? At this time, I'll swear in any witness uh, who's present. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence I give upon this hearing by the Senate of Texas of impeachment Charges against Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, pursuant to Rule 24, the rule has been invoked. The rule means that witnesses, except the members of the court, the parties, and their counsel, must remain outside the hearing of the courtroom at all times while testimony is being heard, except when testifying or until discharged. If you are a witness, 
Please remain in town and available to promptly appear at the Capitol if the court or either party calls on you. You must not converse with each other or with any other person except counsel for the parties concerning the proceedings before the court and are not to read any report, watch any live stream or broadcast of the proceedings, including news reports or social media or comment on testimony before the court. Any witness violating this instruction may be punished for contempt, up to six months in jail, or a $500 fine. Do you all understand? Thank you. You're dismissed. Members, at this time, we'll break, just because this is a perfect break point for lunch, uh, be back at one, and then we will have opening statements when we return. Thank you. Thank you, partner.
friends, the Court of Impeachment of the Texas Senate is now in session. The Honorable Lieutenant Governor and President of the Senate, Dan Patrick, now presiding. Mr. Harden, uh, I, I am going to take your a suggestion into consideration on exhibits if time is spent from your side. Thank you very much. Yeah. This time, opening statement by the managers. Mr. Presiding Officer, the Attorney General would like to be heard on one housekeeping matter before that. Yes. The Attorney General seeks a ruling from this court that to the extent privileges, attorney-client privilege, executive privilege, et cetera, may apply, those are held by the Attorney General. Now, we're not asking the court to rule that any particular statement or any particular document is privileged at this time, but for purposes of the manager's opening statement and going forward in this case, we ask that this court rule that those privileges, which all attached during the time at which the Attorney General was the actual acting serving duly elected Attorney General attached to him, were conversations he had with his subordinates, conversations involved with other parties, where he was the client seeking legal advice from subordinates and essentially directing his official functions, and to the extent that those are implicated, we seek a ruling from this court initially that those privileges, if they exist at all, belong to the Attorney General. Mr. Harden, do you have a response? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I do want the record to reflect, in light of the, uh, the court's earlier analogy to a criminal case, I want the record to reflect that the Attorney General apparently is not here. Maybe he's coming at some time today, but I think if we're going to talk about this analogously being a criminal case, that the, uh, the defendant ought to be ordered to appear throughout this just as everyone else. That's number one. But number two is uh, we're prepared to address this issue. There is a motion to, I think, uh, one of the third parties had a motion on the attorney-client issue that, that they were trying to raise. But I would have thought we would have dealt with this before now, just as we were getting ready to do opening statements. They've known they had this issue all along. Uh, if the court wants to hear argument on it now, uh, Mr. Garber was always prepared to do it on our side. We'll be glad to engage in argument, but I think it's totally discretionary with the court as you're ready to proceed. And under the rule, um, the Attorney General Paxton was required to be here addressing that first point throughout the trial. I'm still, still thinking of your motion.
I want to clarify under, I believe it was resolution 36, he was required to be here today, but not all day. So let me clarify that. Yes. Uh, as per the rule, he was here at nine as required. Uh, I didn't see anything else in the rule that required him to be here any other time. You're right, correct. Mr. Harden, Mr. Murr, please come to the bench. Please approach. Mr. Yes, Harden. Sure. Oh, well, Pam. Well. And we have asked for the record the Paxton team, the counselors, to come forward.
I will address, and members, let me just remind, not remind you, but when we're meeting at the bench, the jurors may not come up to the conversation. Um, I'll rule on your motion as they come up. And members of the jury, I want to remind you that statements made in the opening statement is not evidence, and it's an outline of what they're going to present. With that, Mr. Murr? Yes. Having a hard time hearing. Those mics are lower. I don't think they were intended maybe for them to be standing at the table talking. <coughs> that if you could make sure that for those of us who have a hard time hearing in this chamber, that they try to be closer to the microphone. Yes, Senator. The requirement was to be sitting at the mics at the table, not standing. So when you come to the podium, you can stand, but be sure you get into the mic, because it is, the echoes in here are very difficult. Thank you. Mr. Murr, you have 60 minutes. Mr. President, Senators, today is an important day. On this day in 1836, Sam Houston, whose Bible you used for your oaths today, was elected president of the Republic of Texas. Today is also an important day because we begin this impeachment trial. While impeachment is rare, the drafters of our state constitution recognized that there are times when this extraordinary remedy is needed to protect the state and its citizens from a public office holder who has abused the power of his office by putting self-interest above that of the people of Texas. The drafters concluded that this great deliberative body, the Texas Senate, is best positioned to determine what, when this remedy is appropriate. Earlier this year, Mr. Paxton came to the legislature seeking $3.3 million in taxpayer money to settle a whistleblower lawsuit. Mr. Paxton would not answer any questions about the underlying claims. He had successfully blocked any discovery in the case for almost two years, and he refused to justify the settlement. The House investigated the serious allegations raised by the whistleblowers. The House uncovered egregious misconduct and abuse of office by the Attorney General of the State of Texas and voted overwhelmingly to prefer articles of impeachment to the Senate. This is why we are here. The allegations in the articles reveal that the state's top lawyer engaged in conduct designed to advance the economic interests and legal positions of a friend and donor to the detriment of innocent Texans. Mr. Paxton turned the keys of the Office of Attorney General over to Nate Paul so that Mr. Paul could use the awesome power of the people's law firm to punish and harass perceived enemies. I was raised in rural Texas, where a person's honor is more important than money, where integrity matters, by a family deeply affected by political corruption. This is precisely the type of grave official wrong that our Texas Supreme Court has said warrants impeachment. My grandfather, who was privileged to serve the state of Texas for many years, had a favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you really want to test a man's character, give him power. Mr. Paxton has been entrusted with great power. Unfortunately, rather than rise to the occasion, he has revealed his true character. And as the overwhelming evidence will show, he is not fit to be the Attorney General for the state of Texas. Mr. Paxton argues that the Senate should not exercise its constitutional duty to decide whether his conduct merits impeachment because voters were aware of the allegations and still re-elected him. He claims that the Senate should abide by the alleged will of the voters. However, this ignores the intent of our framers of the Constitution. Impeachment was in included in the Constitution 
after the Founding Fathers debated and rejected the idea that elections could singularly protect the public against abusive office holders. In other words, drafters agreed that impeachment was and is necessary to protect against abusive officials because it was simply too easy for them to use the powers of their office to conceal the truth until after the next election. The concept of the forgiveness doctrine is not in our Constitution and does not apply here. The courts have made that very clear. And even if it did, the doctrine presumes that voters know all the facts. The voters did not and do not know the whole truth. Mr. Paxton went to great lengths to hide his misconduct from the public. The evidence will show that he used massive resources of his office to prepare and issue a sham report that allegedly exonerated him. The evidence will show that this report contains false and misleading information about the allegations against him and about the whistleblowers themselves. And he also lied about the independent nature of this investigation. Documents will show that he played a key role in drafting that report. The Constitution says the Senate has the power and the duty to decide this case and to protect the people of Texas from someone who has violated his oath and has shown he does not respect the law. The witnesses and the evidence will show you that Mr. Paxton's conduct merits the exercise of that power. And the witnesses and the evidence will show and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he should be removed from office and prevented from ever holding a position of trust in the state of Texas again. Mr. Paxton argues that the articles do not allege impeachable conduct because they do not allege that he committed a crime. We do allege that he committed crimes. We have detailed that Mr. Paxton received favors, including home renovations and help in concealing and continuing an extramarital affair in exchange for the Office of Attorney General punishing Nate Paul's enemies. However, we don't have to show some type of quid pro quo to establish that his conduct should result in impeachment. As the Texas Supreme Court made clear regarding the impeachment of Governor Ferguson 106 years ago, wrongs justifying impeachment don't have to be crimes. Wrongs justifying impeachment are broader than that because they have the purpose of protecting the state, not punishing the offender. Mr. Paxton, should be removed from office because he failed to protect the state and instead used the power of his elected office for his own benefit. And this was wrong. The oath of office that we all took to protect the citizens of state and to uphold the laws of this state and this constitution means something. It isn't just words on paper. It's literally an oath to God. And Mr. Paxton had an obligation not to abuse his office for his own benefit. He betrayed his constituents and the sacred public trust that's been given him. And in Texas, we require more from our public officials than to merely avoid being a criminal. The witnesses you will hear from are remarkable people. Until they refuse to follow Mr. Paxton's wrongful demands, they were his most trusted, hand-picked advisors, and they believed in his conservative mission for the office of the Attorney General. The problem isn't that their commitment to conservative governance changed. It is at the end of the day, Mr. Paxton wasn't the man they thought he was, and he wasn't the man he publicly proclaimed to be. His trusted advisors are not rhinos, or part of some deep state storyline. They are movement conservatives guided by their faith. These witnesses will explain step by step how they discovered that Mr. Paxton grew increasingly intent and passionate about helping his partner, Nate Paul, escape civil and criminal legal troubles that he was facing. They will describe in chilling detail 
when they connected the dots of Mr. Paxton's slow creep of corruption. The senior staff were outraged when they discovered that Mr. Paxton had directed a young, inexperienced outside attorney to obtain grand jury subpoenas to harass and interfere with an ongoing criminal investigation. Subpoenas that had been improperly issued to DPS officers, a federal judge, attorneys involved in a civil lawsuit against Nate Paul, and even court staff. And the subpoenas sought intensely personal information, including cell phone and email records. Now, I'm not going to detail in this opening all the allegations against Mr. Paxton. You're aware of many of them. You sit as a unique jury, having known Mr. Paxton and familiar with some of the facts. But even a quick summary of some of the evidence that you're going to hear is shocking. One of Mr. Paxton's many acts of deceit involved a member of this chamber at a time when the policy of the state was Texas is open for business during COVID. Mr. Paxton directed his staff to issue a legal opinion advising that statewide forfeiture sales, excuse me, statewide foreclosure sales not move forward. Mr. Paxton was adamant that the opinion, which came to be known as the Midnight Opinion, be issued before the end of the weekend, just in time for Nate Paul to use it to avoid a foreclosure sale the following Tuesday. This conduct benefited Nate Paul, and it harmed businesses and people impacted by foreclosure. Mr. Paxton also used the power of this office to harm a charity, solely to benefit Nate Paul. The Office of the Attorney General is charged with the responsibility of intervening in lawsuits when it's necessary to assist a charitable organization. As you'll hear, the first and only charitable case Mr. Paxton took a personal interest in was the Mitty Foundation's lawsuit against Nate Paul's entities as an investor. The evidence will show that Mr. Paxton directed his office to intervene in the lawsuit, to stay the case, and allow the AG's office the opportunity to pressure this charity to accept a lowball settlement offer. This would have saved Nate Paul millions of dollars. The creep of corruption continued when Nate Paul wanted access to confidential investigation materials related to police raids on his home and businesses. In an attempt to learn what the police knew and how they knew it, Mr. Paul submitted multiple open records requests seeking the full police file. Even though no police file may be disclosed due to the well-established law enforcement exception, Mr. Paxton pressured his deputies to authorize the release of this information. Had he succeeded, Mr. Paxton would have created precedent allowing any person under criminal investigation, whether for a violent felony or a sex offense, to obtain confidential information about the investigations of their conduct. Mr. Paxton simply did not care that his request to release information to Nate Paul would have put police and victims across the state at risk. Unfortunately, the House investigation revealed that Mr. Paxton's relationship with Mr. Paul was far more extensive than even his closest advisors knew. Over the course of three months, Mr. Paxton personally met with Nate Paul more than 20 times. Many times, Mr. Paxton would ditch his security detail, and Nate Paul even set up a secret Uber account that allowed Mr. Paxton to secretly visit Nate Paul and others. To conceal his efforts, Mr. Paxton communicated in off-the-book ways, using burner phones, encrypted messaging apps, and secret email addresses. Mr. Paxton's brazen abuse of the Criminal Justice Division at the Office of Attorney General is finally what caused eight of his senior staff to report him to the police. The question that haunts them and should frighten all of us, is what would have happened if they had not reported him? 
How far would Mr. Paxton have gone in using the power of the Attorney General's office to harass and punish his and Nate Paul's perceived enemies and hurt innocent Texans? Mr. Paxton tries to defend his actions by isolating each event and claiming that standing alone they can't support impeachment. You cannot and should not view each act in a vacuum. The evidence will show that they are all connected. They're all connected by Mr. Paxton and his desire to deliver for his partner, Nate Paul. Mr. Paxton will also argue that the acts represent differences of opinion on policy or efforts to help a constituent. But the witnesses will explain to you that Mr. Paxton's actions have nothing to do with implementing conservative policy. And in fact, his efforts violated those very principles. Mr. Paxton's senior advisors were fully aware of the dire consequences of reporting him to law enforcement. They knew retribution would be swift and vicious. The choice they made to report him to the police was one of the hardest of their lives. But they will tell you that there really wasn't a choice at all. Sam Houston, who on this day in 1836 was elected president of a new and free republic, reminded Texans, do right and risk the consequences. Do right and risk the consequences. Doing the right thing is sometimes not easy. Sometimes we must do the right thing in the face of enormous pressure to remain silent. The witnesses felt this pressure. The House felt this pressure. And the Senate is feeling this pressure. It's unfair and it's wrong. But despite the forces that seek to intimidate the Senate, you have taken the first steps toward the truth by giving the people who did the right thing a chance to testify. Despite the attacks that they know will continue to come, the witnesses will do the right thing once more. And they will take this witness stand and they will provide the clarity that the Senate needs and that the public deserves to find out what was really happening behind closed doors. As chair, I resolutely give this statement with the support of and on behalf of the Board of Managers and on behalf of the Texas House. You all provided us with an hour to make an opening statement. But we prefer to yield back the rest of that time to the most important folks that will show up in this room, the witnesses. The same witnesses that Mr. Paxton has been so desperate to discredit and intimidate and to silence. We are honored to be able to give them their day in this honored and rare court where we simply seek justice on behalf of the people of Texas. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the defense wish to make an opening statement? We do, Your Honor. I think we have 15 minutes to break. Is that what no, was in the rules? You're, you're up right now. May it please the court. I stand in this hallowed chamber in this historic proceeding on behalf of the duly elected Attorney General of the state of Texas. The prosecution and the press, and I'm sure here, will tell a whopping story. It's a tale full of sound and fury. It signifies nothing. And you may wonder why I say that. Because when we are done, I believe that no matter your party affiliation and no matter where you stand now, you will conclude what I have concluded, that there is nothing to this. Ken Paxton gave nothing of significance to Nate Paul. Nate Paul received nothing of significance from Ken Paxton. 
This whole case is a whole lot of nothing. I make my living trying cases to Texas juries. Cases are supposed to be decided only upon the evidence. But I do wonder, are we really going to get a fair trial here? Have you already decided based on what is politically expedient or what's best for you personally? Or is it even possible to get a fair hearing? Especially after this case has been tried in the press, Ken Paxson has been convicted in the press based on ignorance, innuendo, and outright lies. So the question is, will you decide based only on the evidence? Because that's your oath. That's what you swore to do, no matter the consequences. And I urge you to do your duty and do it without fear. They say this is the impeachment of a lifetime. But is it? Because depending on what you do here, maybe it will become commonplace. What happens here will have consequences no matter how it turns out. Let's be clear. If this misguided effort is successful, which I feel confident it will not be, the precedent it would set would be perilous for any elected official in the state of Texas. What is being attempted here hasn't happened in our state in a hundred years. And unlike other efforts of the past like this one, this scheme was rushed, it was secretive, it was poorly planned, and was wholly unsupported by evidence. Indeed, despite the social media frenzy, the misinformed commentators, the reporters with an agenda, at the end of this, you will come to know what I know, that despite all of us being told that the evidence in this matter is 10 times worse than the public knows, it is instead 100 times less. There is nothing here to support impeachment, nothing. Now, there's been a gag order in this case. That gag order put our team at a distinct disadvantage. That gag order prevented us from rebutting this false narrative created by a frenzied press. The gag order, of course, didn't stop those media members with agendas or those media outlets aligned with the House managers, and they were calling for Ken Paxton's head. We've heard in the media about burner phones. <laughs> there are no burner phones, but we couldn't respond. We've heard about secret email addresses, so secret that every person on Ken Paxton's staff used the same type of email address because they were traveling to China. There's no secret email address, but we couldn't respond. We've heard about Uber rides for Ken Paxson in Vegas, Chicago, or to even nightclubs. Those are manufactured lies, but we couldn't respond. We've even heard from the press about cakes from HEB, stolen pens, pilfered sport coats, outright foolishness but we couldn't respond. We heard about house renovations supposedly paid for by the manipulating boogeyman, Nate Paul. That never happened. Ken Paxton and Angela Paxton paid for their house renovations, and I'm going to show that absolutely 100%. They know it, but yet they still stood up here and repeated that lie. Let's talk a little bit about some background. 2015, Ken Paxson ran against the anointed candidate for Attorney General Dan Branch. Branch represented Highland Park and the political elites. Dan Branch was the establishment candidate. Ken Paxson beat him soundly. Almost immediately after that win, Ken Paxson was on the receiving end of a clearly political indictment at the hands of rivals within his own party. That saga continues to this day with a pair of unelected special prosecutors nudging it forward year after year with the expectation and hope that someday they will get paid. Nevertheless, despite being indicted and despite a very public lawsuit that makes the exact same allegations that are being made here, Ken Paxton easily won his last primary, as he has in every election. In fact, Ken Paxton thumped the establishment candidate, who this last time happened to be a Bush. And it wasn't even close. Ken Paxton won 68% to 32% in the primary, 
Now think about that. General Paxton trounced the establishment candidate, a member of the Bush dynasty, and beat him badly. And incidentally, as an aside, did you realize that the day before the vote for this impeachment was had, that that same Bush applied to renew his law license? Let's put this proceeding in context. Almost 30 million people live in the state of Texas. Texans chose at the voting booth who they wanted to be their attorney general, despite the same baseless allegations that are being made here. But because of what this House has done, only 30 people out of almost 30 million will decide whether Ken Paxton is allowed to serve in the office he was voted into. That's not how it's supposed to work. That's not democratic. What could be less democratic than 30 people deciding who serves as the Attorney General of Texas instead of the 4.2 million people who voted to put him there? Every election season we hear, your vote is your voice. It's important to go vote to be a good member of society. We hear about the sanctity of the right to vote. We hear that people fought and died for the right to vote. We hear every vote should count. Yet to get here, Texas House took away the votes of over 4 million Texans who voted for Ken Paxton, and they did it in only a four-hour hearing. There is a right way for Texas voters to remove someone from office. It's called vote against them. Who the people want, who the people have voted for, should matter. Let me give you some names. George P. Bush, Eva Guzman, Louis Gohmert, Dan Branch, Barry Smitherman, Joe Jaworski, Rochelle Garza, Justin Nelson. Those are just some of the people that Texans decided they did not want to be their attorney general. The people chose General Paxton. Do their votes matter? People are watching. The will of those Texans should not be subverted. And people of Texas, let me say this. I am very happy that these proceedings are being live streamed. I think it is good that Texas voters can hear every bit of evidence or the complete lack of evidence that supports this from both sides. I'm sure that the more than 4.2 million people who voted for Ken Paxton will want to hear why, will want to hear why 30 people are deciding his fate. And through all this, we must not forget, Ken Paxson, for the last eight years, has operated the most aggressive, effective litigation apparatus of any attorney general's office in the country. According to the pundits, Ken Paxson was never supposed to be serving in statewide office. But Ken Paxson is very much serving. Look at his record. Under his leadership, the AG's office has won major cases for Texas on immigration, the lives of the unborn, religious freedom, and the continuous overreach by the federal government on our everyday lives. Under his direction, the AG's office has sued the Obama and Biden administrations more than any other AG office in the country. Even CNN has called Texas a legal graveyard for Biden's policies. And under his watch, and with his personal involvement, the Attorney, General, the Attorney General's office has recovered billions of dollars for Texas taxpayers including $3 billion against Big Pharma as a result of the opioid crisis. It has been said, but I think it's worth repeating, Ken Paxton is the best attorney general in the country, period. All of this, of course, begs the most pressing question. If Ken Paxton is so good at his job and routinely defeats his political opponents at the ballot box, then what the devil are we doing here? We know this entire process took less than two months with fewer than 15 witnesses, none of which were ever put under oath. Shouldn't this investigation, if done right, have taken a whole lot longer? After all, this historic procedure took an entire year the last time it was used, with sworn testimony taken by the committee, in open hearings, giving the respondent an opportunity to be heard, to confront his accusers. So why was it so short this time? Why did it happen when it did? What was the rush? Because if they had taken their time, 
and done it right, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't hear about burner phones. We wouldn't hear about house renovations. We wouldn't hear about secret Uber rides. We wouldn't hear any of that foolishness because they would have delved into it and saw that it was all false. So why? I'll tell you why. On May 19th, 2023, Speaker Dade Phelan was so drunk while running house business, he could barely even hold the gavel. And that drunkenness was on video and was on the internet for the entire world to see. I'm sure you've seen the video as well. Four days later, on May 23rd, Ken Paxton issued a statement and called for Dave Phelan to resign. In response, the committee hurriedly met the very next day, conducted a four-hour hearing, and recommended impeachment the day after that. Because of the rush, the House didn't bother to vet this foolishness, and now they put it right in your lap for you to do the work that they failed to do. This impeachment was the perfect marriage of a group of representatives fueled by a powerful lobbyist and led by a drunken speaker seeking political vengeance. It was also a result of a group of uninformed civil litigants and their attorneys who were motivated by money. The House's General Investigating Committee proceeded in a rush, in secret, so secret, in fact, that the only people who could have testified and brought actual evidence and exonerated Ken Paxton were not even called. I hope you will look at the evidence. I hope you'll really look at the evidence. I have faith in this body that you will actually see the evidence and make an informed decision. I want to focus just on a few of the impeachment articles. There's so many of them, I wouldn't have time to go through every one. But I think one that you might be interested in is Article 10. That's the article where the House managers have argued that Ken Paxton's house renovations were paid for by Nate Paul. And you've heard that lie repeated over and over and over again in the press, and it's false. The House managers adopted this lie about a non-existent bribe and repeated it with no evidence, nothing. The news media endlessly amplified this lie without ever documenting it. And then it's been repeated over and over and even repeated by my colleague today. Hear this, press corps. Ken Paxton and Angela Paxton paid for their house renovations, period. You will see in this case a steam team estimate. The Paxton's house in Terrytown had some water damage. Steam team came out to correct the water damage. We're going to show you those documents where USAA claim was made to pay for that. You will see that the Paxton's had fits with the insurance company, just like all of us have at one time or another, trying to get that claim paid. You will see that Angela Paxton specifically was involved in talking through some of the repairs they were going to do as, a, as part of that process. They were going to do some upgrades. And you'll see mind-numbing pictures of Angela and Ken Paxton at Home Depot, at Lowe's, pricing stoves, pricing countertops, trying to get the best buy and ultimately deciding that despite what you hear about granite, with all due respect, Senator Paxton, their countertops are just old ratty tile. And they didn't get a new stove. And they didn't get to change out their cabinets. But that's not what you've heard in the press. I'm going to show you the USAA docs. I'm going to show you, that on September 16th of 2020, USAA made its final determination of what they would pay. They paid for Steam Clean, the original contractor, and the second contractor was Cupertino Builders. And you've heard, oh, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a foul. Busby, in the press conference, he showed, he showed Cupertino Builders' invoice. That company didn't exist. Well, guess what? It did. It absolutely did. I'm going to show you the documents, and you're going to see that this article is false, just like every other one. 
You're going to see the U USAA determination. You're going to see that USAA knew that they had another contractor. You're going to see a, a text from, from the trustee back and forth between Ken Paxton, where Ken Paxton says, I have this invoice, I have to pay it. You're going to see all that, and you're going to see the wire come from the Paxton's bank account and go into C C Cupertino Builder's bank account. You're going to see the front side of the transaction and the back side of the transaction, and you're going to conclude like I've concluded, like everybody has to conclude, that these folks were pinching pennies. They were trying to, to update and renovate their house, and there were a lot of things they just couldn't afford. I'm going to show you pictures ad nauseum of their house, and you will conclude what I've concluded is the Paxtons have been defamed over and over in the press and by the house. Now, the second so-called bride, Nate Paul, the boogeyman Nate Paul gave Ken Paxton $25,000. Oh, goodness gracious. Do you know when he gave that money? October 2018. Years before any of these allegations ever existed. Years before any of the acts allegedly that occurred ever occurred. Think about their theory. Their theory is Nate Paul in October of 2018 was thinking, he was so manipulative and so smart that he knew at some time, sometime years in the future, he may be needing something from Ken Paxton. Here's the problem with that. He gave money to people in this very chamber as well. Ken Paxson wasn't the only recipient of a campaign donation, but let's focus on campaign donations. Incidentally, in 2018, Ken Paxson raised millions upon millions of dollars, a $25,000 donation, although it sounds like a lot of money. Ken Paxson is a great fundraiser. He raises a lot of money, and that donation ain't even a blip on the radar screen. But let's think about that. Campaign donations can't be bribes. They are not bribes. Do any of us believe that a campaign donation in here is a bribe? You know how, how often I get calls for campaign donations? A lot. Are those bribes? No. If campaign donations were bribes, everybody in this town would be impeached. Just line up. Once we finish Ken Paxton, we'll start impeaching everybody else. I want to shift our focus from the time I have and, and address what could be the elephant in the room. There's been some salacious allegations made about Ken Paxton. The argument is, is that Nate Paul provided a job for a woman named Laura Olson. It doesn't hold any water. Laura Olson applied for a job. Laura Olson got a job. You're going to see the employment contract. You're going to see what her salary was. You're going to see her pay stubs. You're going to hear about the work that she did. And you're also going to hear that she continues to do that work today. Today. That was not a bribe. That was a job sought out and received. And she's doing real work today. You'll see the pay stubs and you'll see the employment application. Now, you've heard so much. My colleague talked about how Ken Paxson turned over the keys to the AG's office to Nate Paul. Remember hearing that? Totally false. One of the things you're going to see in this case is that Ken Paxson got nothing from Nate Paul, and Nate Paul got nothing from Ken Paxson. Let's look at what Nate Paul got from the AG's office. Nate Paul believed that the feds had targeted him. He believed that the feds had violated his civil rights. He believed that an affidavit, a warrant for the search of his home and businesses had been altered. He believed it, still believes it today. He didn't know where to go. He went to Ken Paxson. Ken Paxson sent him to the Travis County District Attorney's Office, who then turned around and referred it back because of conflicts. There were conflicts. But what did Nate Paul get from that? No bankruptcies were averted. No foreclosures were stopped. No FBI agents were indicted. No FBI agents had to respond to any subpoena. Nothing. Nate Paul got nothing. If that was an attempted bribe, 
That was the least effective one in the, in the history of the United States. You're going to see. Nate, Paul got nothing. In fact, you will also see email after email after email of Nate Paul and his lawyers sending letters to the AG's office madder than a hornet's nest. You're not doing what you're not doing your job. You're not doing your job. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. We're going to sue the AG's office. Does that sound like somebody who has the keys to the AG's office? It sounds like somebody who might be a little entitled and thinks that public officials should jump when he says jump, maybe jump and hope he jumps high enough. But one thing is clear, Nate Paul got nothing and he was very unhappy about it. He did not think the AG's office was doing its job and he sent email after email, letter after letter, culminating in a letter where he threatened a lawsuit against the AG's office. You never saw those emails, did you? You never saw those letters, did you? You never even heard about them. The press knows about them. They didn't report that, did they? This idea that the AG's office harmed the MIDI Foundation. Do you know who the MIDI Foundation is? Do you know their history? Do you know who the first AG was that had issue with the MIDI Foundation? Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott. Greg Abbott sued the MIDI Foundation for all kinds of foolishness. They had one person indicted. They had another person who allegedly beat their wife and child. There was like a lot of turnover. And in this particular instance, you will see why the AG's office decided to intervene. There's a memo, a memo that lays out the, the tortured history of the MIDI Foundation and the decision-making matrix and every single person in the chain of command signed off, including the so-called whistleblowers, to intervene in the MIDI Foundation case. Not to protect charity. See, this is the mis misconception. The, D the AG's office is not there to protect charities, as has been alleged. The AG's office is there to protect, to protect the public's interest in charity. In other words, those are donated funds, and the charity better take care of its P's and Q's. And the MIDI Foundation was not. And Nate Paul was so mad that the AG's office wasn't doing more. The AG's office intervened. The intervention lasted three months, and the AG's office dropped the case once they saw what was going on. And remember this. You'll see the memo where not only did the entire chain of command decide to intervene in the MIDI Foundation litigation, but also decided to open an investigation of the MIDI Foundation. Have you heard that in the press? This is what we're up against. We are trying a case not here in front of you, honorable members. We're trying a case where we're getting prosecuted in the press. And so here we are, the baseless allegations thrown at us, shotgun approach, throw it against the wall, see what will stick and make them respond. That's what this is. That's what this is and that's what it has been. There's a reason my, count, my colleague did not go through any facts to support this because there are no facts to support this. And let's also talk briefly about this so-called midnight opinion. Again, utter foolishness. Did you know on the very day that the, the informal guidance was issued, they issued another one the very same time frame, like the very same day? You want to know how many foreclosures were stopped by the informal guidance? Zero. They didn't report that either, did they? And you didn't hear that either, did you? Many of these articles, I would, I would respectfully suggest, if you look at what's alleged and you look at the evidence, you'll dismiss it out of hand. Just, this is a good one. They claim that this was a, an AG's opinion, this so-called midnight opinion. On the very face of the document, it says this is informal guidance. It's not a 402 legal opinion. That should have been the reason that should have been dismissed. But we will show that to you. We will prove that to you, and that article should be disposed of in short work. Now, finally, let me talk about these ex-employees. 
One of the facts that I find to be the most egregious with regard to these ex-employees is that they made assumptions about their boss, but they did not raise those assumptions with their boss. Many of the issues in this particular case, most of those so-called whistleblowers participated in and signed off on. You know what the genesis of all this is? Remember when I talked about the referral to the, uh, from the district attorney's office to the AG's office? They were unaware that the district attorney's office had done a second referral that did not go through the AG's office. It went directly to this young man, Brandon Kamick. And so when they saw that Brandon Kamick had gotten subpoenas that went to some financial institutions, they just, they, um, their heads almost exploded. And rather than asking the questions, calling the DA's office, finding out what was going on, they just assumed that this young man, this young lawyer who was being paid 300 bucks an hour, because that's, that was the, the rate, and that's why we got somebody like Brandon Kamick. But they assumed that he was off, off doing something untoward. And they never asked the questions, why would you be subpoena in a financial institution? It's because it was a second referral from the DA's office, a second referral that gave him the authority to investigate bid rigging. We all know there was bid rigging going around, going on in Austin. That was what the DA referred to the AG's office to investigate, not prosecute, investigate. They assumed, they assumed the worst. And instead of asking their boss, you know what they did instead? They sent a letter to the FBI saying that Brandon Kamick had appeared in front of a grand jury. He never appeared in front of any grand jury. The subpoenas were prepared by the DA's office. All he did was docu-sign them. And they sent that letter to the, to the FBI. They came and met with some of the governor's staff. They came and may have met with some of you even, instead of meeting with their boss that they claimed they were loyal to. And you know, you want to know what's most egregious? They sent letters, and they took Ken Paxton's name off the letterhead. Now, you think about that for a minute. Oh, these people were retaliated against and fired. Ken Paxton was trying to hide something. Let me, let me just ask you point blank. If one of your staff, your chief of staff, decided that he disagreed or she disagreed with one of your actions and decided when you were in, out of the office in Ohio trying to put together the Google case with a bunch of other AGs to recover monies for the state of Texas while you're gone, they get together, they send everybody home, and eight of them meet, and they take Ken Paxton's name off the letterhead and start sending correspondence without his name. Imagine if your chief of staff did that. You would fire them on the spot. If you're a subordinate and you disagree with your boss's course of action, you raise it with her or him, and if there's still a disagreement, you resign. That's how it works. What you don't do is try to hijack the office, wage a coup, or all the other things that did. Uh, sabotage grants. You know, they tried to sabotage the grants that the AG's office would receive. Millions of dollars in grants. They tried to sabotage the office. You're going to hear a much different story when you hear the evidence. A much different story. And let me finish with this. There's a young man named Drew Wicker. He's been all over the news. You remember who I'm talking about? You know, I think my, my colleague made it clear. And we all know that you guys read. I mean, obviously, you pay attention to what's going on. That's part of your job. There's a young man named Drew Wicker, a good young man. He was interviewed by the House investigators. I want you to watch, watch and listen to that interview because they asked him, did you ever deliver anything to Nate Paul? No, never, never happened. They came back five minutes later. When you delivered things to Nate Paul, how many things did you deliver? This is how they did this young man who feels like he's in between a rock and a hard place. He's friends with some of the people that quit or were fired, and he still says that Angela and Ken Paxton are like family to him. And they squeezed him. 
and they squeezed him. He's the one, you may recall, that said, I was there in the kitchen and Angela had expressed that she wanted granite countertops and Ken Paxton was there with me and Kevin Wood, the contractor, says, let me check with Nate. And then we heard about $20,000 granite countertops. I don't know where those are, Senator Paxton. I don't know where those are. What you'll see instead is I have the samples that they went when they went to Home Depot and Lowe's and they sampled and they priced it and they decided they couldn't afford it. Nate Paul had nothing whatever to do with it and Drew Wicker knows that is true as well. We look forward to putting on this case and we hope, we hope you'll listen to all the evidence. We hope that you'll make a decision not based on political expediency but based on the evidence you're going to hear. And remember... The burden of proof. It's not we throw out allegations and you say, oh, that sounds sexy, I'm voting for impeachment. They have to prove their case by the numbers, by the numbers beyond a reasonable doubt. They won't be able to do that. And on that point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague for my time remaining, Dan Cogdell, who has some points he'd like to make. Dan? A monitor up there. I'm sorry for the format, but can I at least see off this? One. Afternoon. I'm sorry, sir. Counselor, you're going to have to stay at the mic. I'll, yes, sir. Thank I'll you. do my best. Good afternoon. My name is, whoa. Getting off to a great start. My name is Dan Cogdell. Anthony Oso and I are two of the lawyers that are helping Ken Paxton. You know, when you get ready for a case like this, there's some things that you know, and there's some things that you don't know. Well, in this case, when I was preparing, I knew I was going to know most of the lawyers. I know my opposing counsel, known them most of my life. Uh, they're, they're friends. I'm not going to say anything negative about them. Uh, it should give you some pause, though, because if they're friends with me, you know their judgment is a little bit askew. That having been said, I know some of the witnesses. I know Mr. Penley. I know Mr. Maxwell. Most of these people are good people. I have no problem with their character, generally speaking. I have a big problem with some of the things that they did. I don't mind sharing with you that my wife is going through a significant medical issue. And what the best time for me to come here. But she said, no, you go. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than you. And this is bigger than Ken Paxton. No offense, Ken. She's not your biggest fan. But what she meant by that is we are living on the wet end of democracy right now. Is it up to the voters or is it up to politicians to see who stays in office? Your, your decision is much bigger than Ken Paxton. Your decision is literally about democracy in this state. I appreciate Mr. Murr's comments. I also appreciate the focus on the bigger picture and what's happening in here. One of the things that's intimidating, even I've, I've been doing this for a long time, 42 years. Sometimes I don't recognize that dude in the mirror when I walk in in the mornings. But I, I wondered to myself, how do I begin a case like this? This is a case of enormous consequences. I wanted the press, I wanted the sound bites, I wanted the cute things, right? As a, as a side note, this may be one moment I get to relish because I'm not automatically the biggest ego of the lawyers involved, not automatically, I have some competition. The significance of this case is titanic, as I mentioned. And I wondered, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna say? Oh my God, I need the hook, I need the line, I need, I need, I need the pop. 
and it occurred to me, I don't need that. It occurred to me that I have the truth. It occurred to me that the reason we're here, how did we get here? This is the very room where General Paxton has been sworn in again and again. This is the very room, as I understand it, where one of his daughters got married. How do we go from that to here? I'll tell you how. Because people assumed things that weren't true. They assumed that Paxton was involved in an illegal relationship with Nate Paul. They assumed that Paxton's actions were intended to get the records to Nate Paul. They assumed that Paxton gave the DPS records to Nate Paul. They assumed that, that, that Paxton hired Kamek illegally. All of those things are false. All of those things are false. Even Einstein said assumptions are made and most assumptions are wrong. A man much lesser, perhaps, than Einstein, but it's important to me, my dad, he told me when I was a young kid, you know, son, how do you, you can't spell assume without making an ass out of you and me. And he's right. And that's exactly what happened in this case. The reality is, this is not a trial where you can assume anything. This is a trial that requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Spoiler alert, it's the same amount of proof that's required in a death penalty case. I'm a visual learner. I like to see things to help me learn. So I'm gonna offer these next slides to you. Just, they're not the law, but they're an explanation. We deal with different standards. A lot of you are lawyers. A lot of you know these things, but a lot of you have never dealt with proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So let me suggest probable cause. If probable cause were a house, probable cause might look like that. Probable cause is the same standard by which the house had to, quote, indict or return the articles of impeachments. That is the quantum of proof that was required. Preponderance of the evidence. That is the, that is the standard that Mr. Busby uses in his, in his, in his cases. Those are in 50 versus 50 and a half versus 40, any slight more, any little bit more. That's a preponderance. Clear and convincing evidence. That is the same quantum of proof that is required in a, in a situation where CPS wants to take your child away. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt if it was a house, it would look like that. It would look like Mr. DeGarren's house. It would look like a big house. Sorry, Dick. My point is a pretty simple one. There is a huge difference between the quantum of proof that the house based its decision on and what you are required by law to base your decision on. It's night and day. I'm gonna go through the articles quickly. Judge, how much time do I have left? Oh, good. 21 minutes. Uh, I may give a couple of those back. We'll see. Here's the allegation that Paxton directed employees at his office to act contrary to law by refusing to render a proper decision relating to a public information request for records held by the DPS by issuing a decision involving another public information request, which is a mouthful that was contrary to law and applicable legal precedent. That's the allegation. Here are the facts. Fact number one is that Paxton is the Attorney General. Paxton, as the Attorney General, can decide how his office responds to these inquiries. He's the Attorney General. Fact number two, Paxton did not order the release of the records. That's kind of been lost in the wash here. There's all these suggestions that Paxton ordered the release of the records that ostensibly were favorable to Nate Paul. No, he didn't. He did not order the release of those records, period, full stop. What he did was had his office take no position on whether or not the records should be released. That's a different color of horse.
Fact number four, that no records were released to Nate Paul as a result of the actions of Ken Paxton. Let me repeat that. Nate Paul got not a single record based upon the action of Ken Paxton. Fact five, there were other records that were released to Nate Paul and his lawyers, but they had nothing to do with any action by Ken Paxton. You follow me? Other records were released, but not at Paxton's direction, suggestion, interference, what have you. Misuse of official information, the allegation, specifically Paxton improperly obtained access to information held by his office that had not been properly disclosed for the purpose of providing that information to the benefit of Nate Paul. That's the allegation. The facts are a little different. Fact number one, Paxton did not illegally access any records. Let me repeat that. Despite what the allegation is, he never accessed any record illegally. It didn't happen. As the Attorney General, Paxton had every right legally to access those records. Fact three, there's no evidence that Paxton copied those records. I'm kind of getting, getting, getting into the weeds with you here, but bear with me. There's a fellow named Vassar that you'll hear about. He had the file and is responsible for maintaining that file. He gave those files to Mr. Wicker, who Mr. Busby talked to you about. Mr. Wicker is an aide that, that works with, with Ken. Wicker says he was never asked to copy the file. I think the evidence is gonna be pretty overwhelmingly that Ken Paxton may be more technologically challenged than me. So if anybody was gonna copy those files, it wouldn't be Ken Paxton. I'm not even sure he had the code to the copy machine. Paxton gives the file back to Wicker after Wicker gave it to him. Wicker gives it back to, to Vassar. And there's no evidence that Paxton gave those documents to Mr. Paul. There's this big kerfuffle. And look, you're gonna hear from a, from a fellow by the name of Dave Maxwell. Dave is six foot six. Without the Stetson, you call Central Casting and ask them to send you a Texas Ranger. And by God, they send you Dave Maxwell. I'm a fan of Dave Maxwell, generally speaking. But Dave Maxwell did some things and said some things that weren't true. While he was being interviewed by the House, he said, and I quote, Ken Paxton, uh, Ken Paxton gave the file to Drew Wicker and he delivered it to Nate Paxton in an alley in the dark of the night. That's absolutely false. Maybe Dave was just comfortable in his own skin and thought he could stretch out his credibility. It's either a mistake or a lie. I, I don't care. Whatever it was, was wrong. That never happened. Months later, Wicker gives an envelope to Nate Paul, an envelope, but there's no evidence that that envelope contained these celebrated documents, and I suggest to you that these documents would have been several inches thick, not two or three pages, and it was, it, uh, I'll, I'll skip past that, but at the time, or really after the time, when the Board of Managers is claiming that Nate Paul surreptitiously had these documents, his lawyers are still suing in court to get the documents. That makes no sense. Why would his lawyers still be pursuing civil remedies, which they're entitled to do, to get these documents if he already had the documents and if he'd gotten those documents from Ken Paxton. That is dumber than a bucket of hair. It makes no sense. They're just wrong. Maybe they had good intentions. Maybe this was their belief for the moment, but they're wrong. Fifth allegation, disregard of official duty, the engagement of Brandon Kamek. It is, while holding as office as Attorney General, Ken Paxton misused his official powers by violating the laws governing the appointment of prosecuting attorneys pro term or pro tem, we'll get into that. And Paxton engaged Brandon Kamek, a licensed attorney, to conduct 
an investigation into a baseless complaint. That's the allegation. During which Kamek issued more than 30 grand jury subpoenas in an effort to benefit Nate Paul, whatever. Here are the facts. Fact number one is Paxton has every legal right to hire Brandon Kamek. We're gonna get into the why, but he's got that right under the government code. You're gonna hear a bunch of kerfuffle about one of my favorite terms, the EAM, the Executive Action Memorandum. Sorry, but only in state government could we come up with a phrase like the Executive Action Memorandum. What it really is, it's policy. It's not the law. It's an internal policy within the Attorney General's office. It is not the law. Fact two, Kamek was not an, a, an attorney pro tem. Maybe that's a distinction without a difference, but that's what they've alleged. And you would think that these lawyers and the, the, the investigative committee and the committee are full of lawyers, most of which, or many of which are ex-DAs. An attorney pro tem is appointed when the entire office has been disqualified. This had nothing to do with that. Brandon Kamek was hired, as the documents say, as an outside counsel. But they've alleged in their complaint, he was an attorney pro tem, he was not. Fact three, a baseless complaint. Here's the funny thing about being a baseless complaint. They forgot to tell Brandon Kamek about that. And we've got a lot of people that have been hurt by these allegations and the investigations, and I guess it depends on your viewfinder on whose ox is getting gored, and whether you like Brandon Kamek or not, he got absolutely skewered in the press. He was vilified by the press. He was just taken to the woodshed. He was beat like a rented mule by the press. And all that young man was trying to do was doing an investigation that the people who work for Ken Paxton wouldn't do. And guess what? No one bothered to tell Mr. Kamek that it's a baseless investigation. In fact, he was told by Ken Paxton the same thing that Mark Penley was told by. Ken Paxton, who parenthetically, I know and I like, but he didn't do anything. But the, more importantly, the direction given to Penley, the direction given to Kamek was the same. Find the truth. Let me repeat that. The direction that Paxton gave him in this corrupt, invasive, corrosive, bribery, kickback, horrible scheme the direction he gave Mark Penley, who worked for him, was exactly the same direction he gave Brandon Kamek. Find the truth. We're going to impeach a sitting attorney general for giving the direction, find the truth? Not one person, not one piece of evidence will you hear where they say lie, where Ken Paxton told him to lie, cheat, steal, shade, do whatever it takes. I just... That didn't happen. That didn't happen. And yet here we sit with 31 of you, with 15 of us and 15 or more of them. Here we sit when the allegation, when the, when the allegation is it's corrupt, when the, when the truth is, he said, go find the truth for God's sakes. What are we doing here? Oh yeah, this baseless complaint that Mr. Murr, nice to meet you, sir, that Mr. Murr referred to, it wasn't a baseless complaint. The Travis County DA's office referred it to the AG's office and ultimately a second one to Brandon Kamek. It may not be the greatest, sexiest complaint ever, but it wasn't baseless. Fact four. No one bothered to tell Brandon Kamek. I think I've got a bit histrionical about that. And another one of my friends, Johnny Sutton, former United States attorney, worked under W, great lawyer, fine fella, 
But these same folks, the whistleblowers that are carping so much about Ken Paxton and going outside counsel and doing all these ultra-virus things when they hire another lawyer, they were trying to hire Johnny Sutton, who last I checked was an outside lawyer. Now, you got to be asking yourself, why is it that Paxton hired Kamek? Number one, Paxton believed in good faith that there had been misconduct. Number two, he asked his deputies to investigate it. His, his, his direction was simple, seek the truth. His staff did little to nothing in terms of an actual investigation. He asked again, nothing really happened. No one seemed to be interested in it at, at any of it. For two months, it just sat there. The one time where Ken, pa Ken, uh, Ken Paxton comes to Mark Penley and says, hey man, I'd like you to look at this. He does nothing. He does absolutely nothing. Frustrated, he interviews outside lawyers and decided on Kamek. And again, he gave Kamek the same investigation, or same instruction he gave Mark Penley. Find the truth. At no time did Paxton ever seek to impede, impair, obstruct. Here's one of my favorite vignettes that you're going to see. Dave Maxwell, his six foot six Texas Ranger, iconic figure. He's going to come in and say he was asked to participate in an illegal investigation. Really, Ranger? It's an illegal investigation, and on video, according to you, if your world right, if your worldview is right, they ask you right there on videotape to participate in an illegal investigation, and you just sat there like a bump on the log. You didn't arrest anybody. You didn't make a note. You didn't cause their engine to file. It was illegal, and you were asked to participate it, and literally, there you sat. This is... Our legendary one riot, one ranger in action, doing nothing? Really? Paxton just wanted it investigated. Uh, Mr. Busby stole a little bit of my thunder on these, these um, letterhead issues, but the point might be worth stating again. Who in the world do these people think they are? Honest to God, if your chief of staff came in and scraped your name off the letterhead and sent it out, how long, how much longer do you think they'd be working for you? They, they wouldn't be, and they shouldn't be. Who in the world gave these people that idea? Who in the world told these people it was, it was going to be okay? I bet you the evidence is no one. They took it upon themselves. They deputized themselves and were some sort of power ranger team where they <laughs> could just do whatever they wanted, scrape Ken Paxton's name off the, off the letterhead and send these letters out. Mr. Busby also talked to you about Michael Wynn's letter to Paxton, but I think it bears repeating. Under their worldview, when, who represents Nate Paul, writes a letter to Ken Paxton, his supposed co-conspirator, threatens to sue his co-conspirator, threatens to sue the office of the attorney general, alleging false statements made by Ken Paxton to damaging uh, Mr. Paul's reputation, claiming inappropriate coordination to undermine the investigation, alleging obstruction to, present, to prevent the Mitty Foundation investigation, literally bringing suit against one of his, what in the real world would be a co-conspirator. What's next? A hired hitman suing for breach of contract when he doesn't get paid for the kill? Are, are you kidding me? This makes absolutely no sense, none. And the reason it makes no sense is because there was no illegal relationship between Paxton and Paul. Look, I get it. I understand why there's some eye rolls about Paxton doing things that most of you would think, ah, I don't know about that. I, really, I don't know about that. But here's why Paxton was a little different. 
These claims with Ken Paxton that Nate Paul was making, they resonated with him. I hear you. They very well may not have resonated with you, but I'll suggest to you, luckily, you haven't gone through what Ken Paxton has gone through for the last eight years. Let me repeat that, eight years. How do I know eight years? Because I have been by his side on that Texas state securities fraud case. In that case, Paxton believed he had been the target of a wrongful prosecution. And here's why. Number one, it's, it had been pending for six years at that point, back in 2020 when all the fur was hitting the fan. Counselor, you have four minutes left. Yes, sir. Thank you. Number two, the judge that presided over the Excuse grand me. Jury. Excuse me. Objection. I believe... I believe the court has said all four of those counts are out of this trial. He doesn't get to start talking about the merits no, I get, of it. I get to talk about his mindset. My, my objection is he shouldn't be talking about this at all based on the court's ruling in the past. I'm talking about his we are not. We're not allowed to talk about it. How can he get up there and opening and give his version of it? I'm talking about General Paxton's mindset as to why these claims were resonating with him. Right. He started talking about a judge. He's talking about the facts. I object. Sustained. Continue. Let me put it this way. Ken Paxton was viewing things from a much different viewfinder than you or I might have been viewing those things through. And there's a reason why he was viewing things differently through a different viewfinder than you and I, because of what he had experienced. And it wasn't what you and I have experienced for the last eight years. Let me get this through so I don't offend Mr. Harden any further. Sorry, Rusty. Here's the difference between what the House did and what you have to do. What you cannot do is assume anything. What you must do is look through the viewfinder of beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, that is a much different process than what the House did. Is there proof beyond all reasonable doubt for you to convict Ken Paxton? And I suggest to you, it is crystal clear that there is not evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. I have one simple ask. Do the right thing. I think the senator led us in prayer, asked for the Lord's help on that. Literally, do the right thing. And the right thing is to vote not guilty. Thank you all for your time. For the record, uh, House managers, you have 42 minutes and 34 seconds returned to you. And you have one minute and 17 seconds returned to you. Managers, before you call your first witness, we need to deal with this motion with Johnny Sutton. A bailiff, will you bring Johnny Sutton forward? Members, we will resolve this motion and we'll take a short break after that. Members, jurors, I'm going to let you take your break now while we're handling this uh, motion. Be back at uh, 
10 minutes before the hour of 3, 2.50. please.
Is Mr. Sutton still in here? Bailiff, can you bring Mr. Sutton back? You can just stop there. I just wanted you to be in the room. Uh, Counselors and members, the court received a motion to quash a subpoena recently received by Mr. Johnny Sutton, an attorney who represents several potential witnesses in the case. Mr. Sutton filed a motion to quash the subpoena so he may fulfill his legal duties as an attorney representing the clients. After considering the motion and conferring with counsel for both parties, the court believes at this time Mr. Sutton's representation of his clients would not prejudice his testimony, if any, should he later be called a witness. Therefore, his motion to quash is granted. However, Mr. Sutton, the court hereby orders you to make a diligent search for any non-privileged documents thorough within the scope of what was subpoenaed by the Attorney General to produce those, if any. And we'll, the court will want a response to that search, uh, the court will allow a limited, limited exception to the rule. Uh, to the extent necessary to represent your clients, including appearing in the chamber during their testimony, you ask to be excluded from the rule, but that would take a vote by uh, the entire body. Though you may be present in the courtroom for testimony of your clients, you may not share information between clients. Uh, you may take your designated seat, the managers Please call your first witness. Here. Please bring Mr. Matir in. Mr. Matera, I remind you, you are still under the oath you took earlier, and to help the court reporters clear yes and no's, no head nods or uh huh. Mr. Harton, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Before I start, could I ask if it's permissible to ask the back of the room if they can hear me, since we've all had all these microphone issues here. I want to make sure that that if I'm speaking to the microphone like this, can the rear of the room hear me? Can you hear senators, jurors? Everyone can hear. Hands up. They hear you clearly. All right. Thank you very much. State your name, please, sir. Mr. Mateer, how old a man are you? Hold on. That mic's not on. You have to hit that button right there. All right. Jeff Mateer. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Was that covered? <laughs> we heard you the first and second time. Go ahead. I am 57. All right. Mr. Mateer, you're somewhat a victim of my warning you to try to speak up when we uh, were talking privately, so I think the microphones have taken care of that, okay? Yes. And uh, where do you live now? I live in Rockwall. I'm going to ask you, in the interest of time, if you would just give us maybe a minute and a half or so, a little bit about your background, where you grew up, 
family, uh, professional career to where you got. Yeah, I actually grew up in central Pennsylvania, uh, and then I met a girl from Fort Worth, uh, and we were in D.C. together when I was working on the Hill. You can go down a little bit. Uh, I'll pull yeah. back a little bit about yeah, that's that. Good. Right, we were working, I was working on the Hill for, for first Tom DeLay and then Dick Army. Met my wife. Um, she, if we, our relationship was going to continue, it made it clear that our relationship was going to continue in Texas. And so I went to SMU Law School. I graduated from SMU Law School and then after law school went to Carrington Coleman for the first part of my career. Carrington Coleman is a Dallas law firm. Is it's a right? large Dallas law firm, about 100 lawyers when I was there. And, and that was approximately, well, not approximately, it was 1990. Stop there and then I'll try to do a question and answer now. Uh, when you were at Carrington Coleman, uh, were you also involved in any kind of outside activities at that time? Yeah, I'd always, since college, I'd always been involved in Republican politics. And so I, I started, you know, did that in college. I was uh, vice president and treasurer of college Republicans. And then even though, I mean, anybody that's been an associate at a law firm knows at a large law firm, you don't have a lot of time, especially if you have a family, because I had a young family, but I still stayed involved. And then I be began to volunteer on religious liberty cases. All right, now I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, we're going to try to do kind of short answers and I'll try to jump in. You're, you're aware, as every witness is, that we're working on a time clock here. Yeah, I'll do um, my best. I want to, it, that's, that's just my fault. That's, it's my job. Don't you worry about it. Yeah. Um, so were there any particular organizations from the time of college or law school on that you belonged to? Yeah, I, I was a member of Christian Little Society starting in, in um, uh, law school, and then in law school also became a member of the Federalist Society. And very briefly, Federalist Society, how would you describe it and what it is? Federal Society is, is predominantly conservative and libertarian lawyers or, in the case, or law students who care about the rule of law and conservative and libertarian policies. In addition to your political views on legal issues and others, uh, have, were you, can you, without getting into much detail about it, um, how would you describe your, your life and your religion? Yeah, I mean, I, I would describe myself as an evangelical Christian. And uh, at the, do you belong to a particular denomination? Uh, I'm a member of a Baptist church. Okay. Um, are you a rhino? Am I a rhino? Are you, um, are you a rhino? Do you I, know? Wait, slow down. You understand the term, do you not? Republican in name only yes. is the term. Would you give the jury a benefit of your background and your political views? Well, I mean, I'm certainly far from right of center. Um, I was nominated by President Trump to be a federal judge. That and your nomination wasn't. A my nomination was not successful um, after there was opposition uh, from, well, some re liberal Republicans and all Democrats. And, and the relevance here, I want to ask you about. Have you heard the suggestion that this impeachment is really the product of rhinos, uh, liberals? Uh, Democrats, uh, people that are opposed to the true conservative views. Have you heard that, have you not? I, I, yeah, I've heard that said, yes. All right. How would you apply that description to your? I mean, that doesn't describe the men and women that I worked with on the eighth floor at the Office of Attorney General. We're going to get to that in a moment, but uh, it, it, as far as you yourself were concerned, was one of the issues that defeated your nomination uh, comments that whether you made or didn't make that had to do with transgender politics. Yeah, and I mean, the comments involved me speaking at a Baptist assembly in which I was alleged to make comments that, that people on the left perceived to be anti-transgender. Right. Uh, now, at the I end... I should say I didn't make the comments they said that I made, but that, that was the allegation. What I'm really after, Mr. Mature, uh, uh, in your life, how would you, when you went to the Attorney General's office, how would you describe what you believed in your politics, the mission of the Attorney General's office, and the profession you had chosen? Well, look, I've always been, since law school and throughout my career, I believe wholeheartedly in the role of law. I mean, that's something that the Federalist Society, I think, instills in people who are members, but I believe in the role of law, and I believe in cons conservative policies and conservative practice. And have you always been conservative without going into specific this issue or that issue? Have you viewed yourself very conservative? On my, my, my well, you have to wait me finish. You have to let me finish. Sorry. It's okay. 
It's not often that people like me get a chance to. Well, I'm in a different. Wait, wait a second, you have to wait. <laughs> not often people like myself get a chance to correct people who've been a chief of staff of some organization. So I'm taking the liberties with it, okay? And I'll stop you if, if you volunteer. Just try, let me finish and I'll try to let you finish. Um, I'm really, it, it, as, in terms of social issues in the political world of the day, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank yourself? 10 or 11. Okay. Now, uh, well, after you, did you go somewhere else after Carrington Coleman in Dallas? Yeah, after Carrington Coleman, a group of us who were Carrington Coleman lawyers formed our own law firm called Rosen, Rosenthal, Reynolds, Mateer, and Schaefer. Where so are you practicing now? It, where are my practice now? First Liberty Institute. And what is First Liberty Institute? It's a national religious liberty law firm. It's actually the largest uh, religious liberty law firm in, in America that's dedicated to defending religious liberty. And indeed, have y'all, since at some time recently, have you participated in several Supreme Court cases? Yes, yeah, since I've been back, I came back in, in October of 2020, we've had four Supreme Court cases, including three very important precedent-setting cases. Well, were all, were all of those cases oriented toward what one might say the religious right? Yeah, I mean, the, probably the most infamous or famous one is Coach Joe Kennedy, the praying football coach, um, who the school district up in Washington fired him because he was kneeling at the 50-yard line after a game. That, that case took eight, eight years. We just celebrated him returning to the football field this last Friday. Now, I want to ask you, why did you, and were you at First Liberty at the time you joined the uh, Attorney General's office? I was. I started at, at First Liberty in 2010. I started at the Office of Attorney General in March of 2016. What was your job when you started with the Attorney General's office? I was first Assistant Attorney General. Have you heard of, um, uh, when did you first meet Ken Paxton? And I was trying to, you know, I've been thinking about that. I, I, I would have met uh, Mr. Paxton sometime uh, prior to probably starting at First Liberty, and I would have been introduced by Kelly Shackelford. And at the time that you began with the office, what calendar year was it? What, what time of year? What year. Uh, it was March of 2016. And, and by that time, how long had you known Mr. Paxton before you began? I would guess it would have been probably almost 10 years, certainly of him. I didn't know him well, but I would have known of him those 10 years. Who hired you? Um, Mr. Paxton. In what way? Did you meet with him? Did he call you? How did it happen? Yeah, he, he actually approached me a few months before March and had asked me if I would cons consider um, coming to, to Austin. Uh, I told him I, I didn't want to come to Austin. Uh, I, quite frankly, I, I had my dream job of being general counsel at First Liberty. Today, I have my dream job. So is the answer you, he asked you to join him in Austin? He did. Okay. Well, and we, you know, I went home and, and we, I agree, he asked me to pray about it. Uh, and my wife and I did pray about it. And we felt like we were supposed to come down here. All right. And then, have you ever heard him suggest in public announcements and, and descriptions and defenses of his of his charges and so that he hardly knew you guys. That he what? That he hardly knew you. He, if he were to say that he hardly knew you, would that be accurate? I, or I, I think- You always, always, always have to let me finish. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, would that be accurate or inaccurate? Th it would be they, inaccurate. They, they, I right. think he knew me very well. Now, after he hired you, when you went on, uh, I'm gonna be wanting to talk to you about the senior staff at the Attorney General's office. Um, and I have a diagram here I want to put up, and I want to try to do this briefly, um, and that is a diagram of the, would you put the exhibit up for me, please? Thank you. All right, you can get the other side. I'll get the other side. Thank you. Now, I, I'm going to try to go briefly, real quickly through this. Counselor? If, I, I, but what I'm after here Counselor? is... Counselor? Excuse me. Are yes, you sure. offering this as an exhibit? As to a demonstrative. As to put as into evidence. Excuse me, just as a demonstrative okay. exhibit for him to just talk about. Um, if you could, uh, would you tell the jury... Uh, and I want to try to do this briefly and move pretty quickly, okay? Um, if you could tell, tell the jury how this describes what 
the roles of each word. And I'm going to go, for instance, your immediate below you was who? Well, b below, below me, not to the side. All right. like, it, below me are the deputies. Yeah. So, so the way that the Office of Attorney General w was organized when I was there and when, when I came in is there were divisions. So it starts on the left with Ruth Ann Thornton, who would have been director of child support. And it goes all the way across to Darren McCarty, who, who would have been the deputy attorney general for civil litigation. And everybody in between, Lacey Mays, deputy for, for uh, administration, Mark Penley, deputy for criminal justice. I think it'll be important to understand your testimony as we go along. Do each of these divisions ha heads have particular responsibilities of their own? They do. I mean, they, they run a division in the attorney general. Don't forget, the attorney general's office is 4,200 employees, approximately 800 lawyers. And so spread out on this chart that, that's before us are the various divisions of the office. All right, thank you. So over, over to the right, or your left as we look at this chart, but to the right on the chart, uh, Mr. Bangert, what, did, what was his responsibility? So Ryan Bangert was the deputy first assistant. So it, he... It, now, let me, let me ask you this. If one were to describe where he comes down on the political scale, liberal, moderate, conservative, obviously each of these are Republican, are they not? Um, as far as I know, each of them oh. are Republicans, yes. Right. And Mr. Bangert, how would you describe his background and his views in terms of the way he dealt with issues that affect people in this country? M Mr. Bangert has similar views to mine. All right. He's a person of faith who's also a very, very good lawyer. He'd worked for Josh Hawley uh, in Missouri. He'd been a partner at Baker Botts. That very much aligns with, with, with me and, and quite frankly, all of our leadership. And then if you go to, your, to the right of you on the chart, to the left of us as we look at it, who is that? Uh, that's Missy Carey. And she, she's a career OAG. Actually, her father was a deputy attorney general. Uh, and as she, I mean, the joke was Missy grew up at the Office of Attorney General. Do you have any evidence that she's uh, a member of the Deep State? Uh, she's not a member of the Deep State. She cares deeply about the Office of Attorney General in, in the state of Texas. Now, if we look, if we look at the, the different persons here, there's been a lot of talk about the whistleblowers. Uh, obviously, you would be one, are you not? I, I'm one of the eight who signed the letter. However, when we hear about the whistleblower lawsuit, did you file a lawsuit? I did not file a lawsuit. So as you sit there now, do you have any litigation pending against the Attorney General's office? I do not. Okay. Do you know whether Mr. Bangert filed a lawsuit? Uh, he did not. Are both of you among the eight that sent a letter uh, to the Attorney General uh, announcing that what you had done and after you had been to the FBI on September the 30th of, of 2020? 2020. Yes. 2020. Pardon me? Yes. Okay. Now, as we go forward real quick, uh, what's the background of Mr. Brickman? Yeah, so Mr. Brickman, he served as deputy AG for policy and strategic initiatives. Uh, the attorney general and I recruited him into the office. He had been chief of staff for Governor Bevin, who was the Republican governor in Kentucky, and, and he had and, lost. And, excuse me, and widely known as a very conservative governor. Uh, governor concerned. Bevin was one of the most conservative governors in the country. All right, go ahead. And I had met Blake the first time at, I'd mentioned Federalist Society. One of the things that Federalist Society did is they brought together leadership from governor's offices and AG's offices. And, and Mr. Mateer, were each of you very active, not just in your states, but nationally in conservative Republican politics, many of which considered the evangelical movement? Yes, we were. All right. And, uh, and then who hired Mr. Brickman? Well, ultimately the Attorney General hired Mr. Brickman, but on my recommendation. All right. And then if we go further, we have Mr. Maxwell there. Mr. Maxwell was there when you got there, correct? Yeah, M Mr. Maxwell, it, it, the way deputies is on the eighth floor, there's a conference room. Mr. Maxwell would sit to my right. He was the director of law enforcement. And he, and he actually uh, had been there quite some time and had a career before you ever arrived, correct? Yeah, I think he approaches 50 years of law enforcement. He's actually in the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame. Mark Penley, who is he? So Mark Penley 
came in after I came in. We had an opening for Deputy Attorney General of Criminal, and we, 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 we interviewed several people. Uh, Mr. Penley had known Mr. Paxton for years. I think they'd been friends for over 20 years. They actually practiced together at a Dallas law firm known as Strasburger and Price. And Mr. So, Pen excuse me. Mr. Penley was also a, a, a career federal prosecutor. He, he was after he was at, I think he was an associate at Strasburger and Price, and then he went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Dallas. On the scale of, of uh, 1 to 10, where would you yourself rank Mr. Pendley in terms of conservative versus moderate? I mean, again, I put him with the same as me and Bangert. I mean, he's at the end of the spectrum. Mr. Maxwell, we, we, we talked about, is one of the, the ones who filed a lawsuit, correct? Right. And then uh, Mr. Pendley is one who did file a lawsuit, correct? That's my understanding, yes. So, those, so this far, and Mr. Brickman filed a lawsuit, right? Yes. We've talked about five of the whistleblowers so far. Two who have not, did not file a lawsuit and three who did, is that correct? That's correct. And then to the right of Mr. Pendley, who is that? That's uh, to my left, you're Ryan Vassar. All right, uh, and, and what do you know about the background of Mr. Vassar? Ryan Vassar was a protege of Brantley Starr, uh, now Judge Brantley Starr. Uh, Mr. Vassar had uh, clerked for Don Willett uh, and, and, and came to the, the Office of Attorney General after his clerkship. And he really, Brantley, Judge Starr, took him under his wing. And he quickly established himself as one of the smartest, go-to, hardworking young lawyers in the agency. And then Leslie Mays? Yeah, uh, Lacey is another person. She actually, I think, started as a um, elementary school teacher and then went to law school. Uh, she was identified by the former deputy for civil litigation, Jim Davis, as a rising star. And uh, she, she, she also did not join the lawsuit? She did not file a lawsuit, no. All right. She's currently Deputy Attorney General of Tennessee. She's the number two person in the state of Tennessee now, is she not, in, in, in the Tennessee Attorney General's office? She is, sir, yes. Right. Uh, after this all over, were you aware she could not find a, a job anywhere in government in, in Texas? I had heard that, yes. All right. So uh, to finish up on this particular subject, now that we've looked at, at who everyone was, to your knowledge, when each of these people joined the Attorney General's office here in the state of Texas, how did they, what would, what, how would you describe their mission in terms of their devotion to the same things the Attorney General spoke very broadly and widely about? Yeah, with all these individuals have in common, again, I told you I'm a Baptist, so I try to, th I think of three C's. Okay, and, and the three C's are calling, character, and competence. And what is calling? What do you mean? Calling, by, and I know wait, that. Wait, wait. Sorry. I actually had just two more words if you had just waited just another few seconds. All right. But what do you mean by calling? Okay. I know calling sounds like a spiritual term, but for me, it's really mission and it's commitment to the mission. And so it, when you're looking for people, certainly in leadership positions, whether it's at the Office of Attorney General, my current job at First Liberty. First thing I want in someone is someone committed to the, committed to the, to, to the mission. They're passionate about the mission. And what were you committed to about serve, as serving as the first assistant for Ken Paxton's Attorney General? We are, we are committed to the rule of law and to conservative governance. What's the second C? The, 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 the second C is competence. So it's one thing to be passionate, like I'm passionate about baseball. But I could never have played in the major leagues, right? But I'm passionate about it, but I'm not confident. So in addition to having passion, you've got to have confidence. You've got to be the best. And I always felt like, you know, whether it's at First Liberty, I want the best. At the Office of Attorney General, in senior leadership, you want lawyers who are skilled, people who are, are the best in their profession. So the third C? Is character. Because of the responsibilities, you have to have men and women who have integrity. And I actually would share this with new employees at the office, because this is what, this is what we wanted. You know, in someone at the Office of Attorney General, you wanted, you wanted passion, you wanted confidence, excel, and, and you wanted character. Mr. Mateer, in 2015, when you joined the Texas Attorney General's office, 2017, 2018, did you feel that office 
was in sync with the views you've just been expressing? I think that, I think it was. And did really 218, 219, did you think that office was in sync with the with values that you've been describing? I believe so, yes. Right. At that time, did you believe in Ken Paxton and all he was saying? Absolutely, and I believe that General Paxton also possessed these characteristics. I wouldn't have come to Austin had I not believed he was a true believer. All right. Did you ultimately change your opinion? And all I want is a yes or no. I did. All right. Let's take you on that road. Um, when is the first time that you ever met? Um, you're going to find me doing that a lot. Yeah. I'm not used to it, but I'm going to do it a lot. Um, when is the first time you met Nate Paul? I've never met Nate Paul. Oh, never? Never. When's the first time you heard his name? Yeah, I've been trying to think about that. Um, it had to have been sometime in 2020. Uh, do you have any reason to believe when it was? Well, I, I, I've recently seen an email highlighting a public information request that I believe was sent at the end of 2019. Uh, it's possible that in early 2020, I heard the name the first time, but, but sitting here, my best recollection is I don't recall hearing his name until probably sometime in the spring right. of 2020. So uh, there was a, I think no one's going to quarrel with the idea that on August the 14th of 2019, this man that you still never met, Nate Paul, had a ex uh, search warrant executed on his house and business, four different, different locations, um, by a combined task force of, of uh, different agencies, Department of Public Safety, uh, Securities, uh, FBI, all on his house. And I don't think the, there's going to be any question that he strongly objected and vociferously opposed what had happened and what he contended was the way. Do you have any, or did you have any memory of noticing anything about that in the year 2019? I, I do not remember noticing that, no, sir. So let's go then to the circumstance uh, in which you would have first, um, if I could, uh, by, what, let me, uh, if, if I could, I, uh, I moved to introduce Exhibit 628. Do you have the ability to show it uh, to the president? and the legal advisor, if not, you can give a hard copy. Before I move to introduce it, I'm going to ask if, uh, uh, if you would look at it and see. Um, yeah, you don't have it, so I'm going to move it to you. Yeah, may, I I, may I give him a copy of this, Your Honor? Yes, you may look at mm -hmm. Just look at hard copy. Any, ob any objection? Uh, have, I, want to know, I want you to look at it and see. Um, do you, re you receive fundraising uh, emails from the Attorney General? You know, I actually am on, I think my personal email does get um, emails from uh, Mr. I, Paxton. I want you to look at this very quickly and see if you have received a fundraiser email like this. I believe I have, yes. Right. I, I, move to, I move to introduce 628, Your Honor. Your Honor, this is a, uh, it appears to be an email from Ken Paxton in June of 2023, which would have no relevance to this proceeding. Oh, I, I think we're now in the month of September, so it's in the past, and it's relevant as to who he says is behind uh, all of what, while we are right here, right this moment. And I just simply want to ask uh, this witness if he feels that he's, that this would accurately describe him as somebody um, that is here testifying about the Attorney General. Again, Your Honor, this man left the office in October of 2020. This is years later, has no relevance. Sustained. Excuse me. I sustained his objection. Okay. You can put that aside. Thank you. Now, um, let me ask you this.
Are you imposed of a radical transgender agenda? Your Honor, objection from reading from a document you just said was not to go into evidence. I'm just simply asking about a phrase. It is free. I got it from it, but I can, I can put this down into it. It'd be best you put it down. Thank you very much. Do you find yourself an advocate, an advocate one way or the other of a radical transgender, transgender agenda? I mean, we represented people at First Liberty who've been persecuted because they had views that are described as being anti-transgender. All right. Now, at the end of that, I want to go now to January of 2020. Did you receive at that time, I want to show uh, Exhibit 559, I move to introduce. Your Honor, I think this tees up the privilege issue right here. We're going to have to decide it at some point. I have no idea what that objection meant. Objection yes. privilege. I mean, this is communications in the office between lawyers, and the privilege is held by the Attorney General. I would suggest it has nothing to do with legal advice in any way. It doesn't become a magically a privilege just by the fact that two lawyers are on the email. So, Your Honor, if you, look, if you look carefully at the document, it's absolutely related to the legal advice, reconsideration of, an, of some sort of opinion. Your Honor, that's Honor, is that's he right a, in the strike zone of what legal advice is. Excuse me. Is he tendering an, an objection, I may ask, on behalf of the Attorney General's office? This was a, an exhibit submitted to us by them. Uh, objection overruled. Continue. All right, now, uh, if you would, uh, tell, tell the court real quickly what this is. It should I, be on. I'm not seeing it. Oh, now I see it. Yeah. Yes. Th this is an email that was sent from me to Ryan Bangert, unfortunately, on January 1st, 2020 at 9.01 a.m. Yeah, is that y'all's normal practice there when you were there to be working on the first day of the year at 9 in the morning? You, you know. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now, did he have a little bit more restraint and wait to respond to you the next day? Yes. Okay. Now, in this particular, in this particular email, um, did you do anything with this afterwards? Did you just simply forward to him and this, that was it? it? The issue apparently was highlighted to me as something we need to take a look at, and I would have sent it on to Mr. Banger for him to, to deal with no. it. Do you know now from looking at what the issue was? I mean, I do know the issue had to do with a public information request made by Mr. Paul and or his attorneys. All right. And so do you, but had you been involved in that at all or would Mr., hold on, would Mr. Bangert be the better person to discuss that with? Mr. Bangert would be the better person. As you sit there now, was this something at that time that you got involved in one way or the other? It was not on, no. Had the issue of the public information request having to do with law enforcement exceptions, had that worked its way to your desk yet at that time? Not that I recall. I think this is the first time. All right. So who would be, at that time, who would have been responsible in the Attorney General's office for the issue of public information request? Uh, Justin Gordon. Pardon me? Justin Gordon? Justin Gordon. And then if we went up the chain, who was above him? Do you recall? Uh, uh, above him would have been, I believe it goes to memory test. I believe it goes to, for me, it would have been Ryan Bangert, ultimately, who, indeed, who was overseeing it. And indeed, so when you got that request, uh, when it says Aaron Borden, were you able to turn, determine who that was in terms of her position or, or context of why you sent the email? Well, the, what I would have is Meadows Coyier, and, and based upon the statement that I've made, we've been asked to take a closer look at this one. That means someone asked me to take a closer look at this one. All right. And, and did you ultimately determine it had to do with a, a uh, public information request by attorneys on behalf, uh, behalf of Mr. DePaul? Nate yeah. Paul. All right. Now, is all you did was just send it on to Ryan Braggart? Was that all you did with it? That's all I did. Does that help explain in your mind why you don't really remember anything about it? Until seeing this, 
uh, and getting ready for today. I don't recall. Okay. All right. Now, um, when is the next time that you remember ever hearing the name Nate Paul? I really think it was June of 2020. All right. So we're in June of 2020, are we? And what was the circumstance in which you did that? I think that's when is, is, is the first time I was introduced to an entity called the Minty Foundation. I think, it, I think that's the name, Minty Foundation. All right. Now, I'm going to uh, move to introduce at this time, Your Honor, Exhibit 62. Before you do that, I want to uh, uh, admit uh, Exhibit 559 that I rolled on into. Thank you very the much. Evidence. No objection to this document. Now, uh, it will be admitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. What would you, what, what do you, uh, could you tell the jury very briefly what this document is? Okay, this is an executive approval memo regarding, um, and I think, I can't move it, but um, I think it's, it's regarding a, there, there we go. It, it's regarding a request to intervene into a legal matter. All right. Now, let, let's uh, we'll try to move this through this quickly. If we, can you very briefly describe the process for a particular, that would call for a, a litigation memorandum like this? Yeah, so anytime we're going to approve some sort of action, if it's filing a lawsuit or it's intervening into a lawsuit, we had in place a process in which the, a lawyer in a division, so in this case, uh, it looks like Mary Henderson, who it's from, would request an action. And in this action, we want to intervene into this lawsuit. So this memo sets forth the reasons why the Office of Attorney General should intervene into a matter. It then goes up the chain of command. So it goes up to her division chief, which in this case w would have been uh, Josh Godby, who was chief of, I think it was uh, financial trusts and, or financial transactions and charitable trusts. And then it goes up to who? And then it goes up to the deputy over civil litigation, who's over all the, the divisions of litigation, and then ultimately it would go up to me. And the way the DocuSign system works is, it, Mary signs it, then it goes to Mr. Godby. Mr. Godby doesn't sign it, Mr. McCarty doesn't see it. Once Mr. Godby signs, it goes to McCarty. Once McCarty signs, it, it would come to me. All right, so this is important, Mr. Materi, and I want to, because there'll be another occasion for this same process. How is the decision made as to who all is on this executive, uh, this executive memorandum? Yeah, we, we had to actually have a signature matrix and, de and depending on what the issue was, okay. we, 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 we had, a, and these were in place when I came in, and, I, and my understanding is they date back to at least when Governor Abbott was, was Attorney General, maybe even further back. All right, so this, this process that requires everybody in the division and then up to you to pass off on it is designed to do what? Well, I mean, the policies and procedures are there to actually protect us all and ultimately protect the agency and also protect the Attorney General. All right, so in this particular case, if Ms. Henderson is recommending the intervention in a lawsuit, is that right? That's correct. And what, and, and lawsuit says the public interest in a charity, correct? That's right. In that recommendation, what would have happened if Joshua Godby, the person right above her in the DocuSign matrix, if he said no, does that kill it? If he says no, it kills it, and I would only hear about it if someone brought it to me. So, are we to understand that if Mary Henderson sent this recommendation above, and it got to Joshua Godby, and he, if he said yes, then it would go to Mr. McCarty, but if he said no, that's it? That's correct. Okay. So, in some actions that are being recommended, how many people is your, was your system designed to work through before it got to you for approval? Well, in this case, three. In some other situations, it's even more people. Okay. We're going to get to one that has to do with out hiring outside counsel in a while. That had a lot more people that had to go through there, correct? That's correct, because we were spending money. All right. And that's what added people? Yes. I mean, right. one of the reasons, yes. And would it also be add people if it crossed two different divisions' jurisdiction? Correct. All right. 
So here on this one, at the time of this one, you signed off and approved it, did you not? I did. So you approved, but your approval on here meant they were, your people were given permission to do what? In a lawsuit involving this charity. It, it gave permission for them to intervene into that lawsuit on behalf of, 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 of the charity. At this moment, on June 6th, or is that 8? I didn't put my glasses on. Um, is that 6-8? I think it's, it yeah. looks like the 8th. All right. At that time, on June 8th of 2020, what was the extent of your knowledge about the particular issue of lawsuit that you were approving an intervention on? It is possible that Mr. McCarty had told me about it, that, and sometimes deputies would give me heads up that something was coming. Uh, and so I, what I, what best recollection is I probably have gotten that heads up. Be, yeah, I would have gotten a heads up. Would you be aware that the line people in the past had waived intervention and made an affirmative decision not to intervene in that lawsuit? I don't think I was aware of that at this time. All right. Were you aware that the lawsuit was a lawsuit between the charity and an entity controlled by Nate Paul? You know, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't remember. I don't At this time, in June of 2020, had you become aware at any level of consciousness in your mind of Nate Paul? Not in early June, I don't think right. so. So we're, we can safely rest assured that whatever you're going to tell this jury today is based on information that you got after June 8th of 2020. That's correct. Sir. All right. So were you aware of any issue at the time you proved the intervention yourself at this time um, that would have clued you to how strongly opposed to this intervention the people who represented the charity were? I, I, I don't recall any of that, no. All right. Now, you see that this, I don't want to go into it, but you see there are multi-pages here. Do you recall you would have, whether or not you would have read through these? Or would you since you relied on the line worker that recommended it? Well, actually, it, it, two answers. I, I would have relied on the people, but I also did read it. Okay. Now, what did you think that y'all were doing in this and why you were intervening in this lawsuit? I, I thought based upon uh, Ms. Henderson, Ms., Mr. Godby, and Mr. McCarty's recommendation, this was in the interest of, of the state of Texas to intervene into this lawsuit. Did you have any idea at that time whether Mr. McCarty thought it was a good idea? Um, I assume since he sent this memo, he did. Were you aware one way or the other as to whether Mr. Paxton had any input in this decision? I, I was not aware, no. It, that wouldn't be uncommon. Do that you would, wouldn't be. That would what? It, it would not, I mean, because the, the Office of Attorney General, at, when I was there, it was over 30,000 litigation matters, cases, civil matters. So, so Mr. I didn't know about everyone, and there's no way the Attorney General could. So let me ask you, at this time, were you aware one way or the other whether Mr. Paxton was in contact with both Mr. Godby and Mr. McCarty urging this intervention? In June, I don't think I was aware of that. Okay. Did you later become aware of that? In July, I became aware of that. All right. But at this time, not? Correct? Not in not in early June, no. I don't believe All so. All right. Now, Were you aware, had you ever dealt with the charitable trust to understand uh, what the obligation of the Attorney General's office was as, toward charitable trust? I mean, I came to learn of it, yes. But you had That's, not. I'm not a charitable trust lawyer. Okay. And at June 6th or June 8th of 2020, were you familiar with the Mitty Foundation one way or the other? I don't think so. Okay. Now let's go, if we can, uh, to uh, Exhibit 67. I move to introduce uh, Exhibit 67, Your Honor. No objection. Can you tell us what this is, please? Admitted into evidence. Excuse okay. me, I'm sorry, I apologize, I jumped the gun no on No problem. Uh, can you tell us what this exhibit is, please? It is another executive approval memorandum for civil litigation, and this one is a request to investigate, not so contrary, not the same as, as intervening, but to investigate a, a charitable trust, the Mitty Foundation. 
Do you have any personal memory or, or anything about this event or why this one was done? Other than it has my initials on it, I do not. And it's a little later, is it not? That's correct. It's, I think, the next day, June 9th. Looks like and I signed it on June 11th. Okay. Now, uh, did you ultimately, I want to go if I can, uh, were you having contact, you've, had the, but you've talked about Darren McCarty, or we have, Joshua McGodry. Were you at this time having any contacts with the line lawyers on this case? Not with the line lawyers. My contacts would have been with Mr. McCarty. He had a one-on-one -on -one every week with me. All right. Now, what was Mr. McCarty's primary duties at this time in the overall scheme of the office? I mean, he was in charge of all the civil litigation. So all those 30,000 cases, they, they would be at Darren. However, his, pro his number one job in addition to leading that was we, we had two major pieces of litigation. One against Google and, and one, well, one that was a big litigation against the opioid manufacturers and distributors. All right. And, and how, many, how much money potentially was involved in that? Oh, billions of dollars. All right. So let me ask you this. Uh, Mr. McCarty, uh, how much of his time would you estimate he was spending on the Google case? I mean, a fair amount of his time. I would say over 50 percent because that was a major piece of litigation for the office. Ordinarily, would he be pulled in to, to managing or doing anything of a, a lawsuit this I mean, size? You, you can't, we have 30,000 cases. I can't be involved in every case. The deputy for civil litigation, one that is not, I mean, obviously significant to the parties, but in the scheme of things for the state of Texas, that's very unusual. Did you have any idea at that time why Mr. McCarty kept getting, in, getting involved in this case? I mean, in June, no. All right. When did you become aware? I, I, Mid-July. All right. Uh, at this time, we forgot, we haven't really mentioned the fact that we're talking about the era of COVID, are we not? We are. And, we're, and, in the, yes. we're in the month of June. COVID was roughly, as far as the, the, the governor's proclamation and everybody running around on it, trying to figure out policy, that was the middle of March, right? Yeah, I mean, COVID took a, I mean, the whole COVID effort took a lot of my time and Mr. Bangert's time and Mr. Vassar's time, quite frankly. Right. Do you have any explanation as to why people such as, as he and y'all were being involved in this kind of case? I mean, we, we just normally wouldn't have been involved in this time of case. All right. Uh, now, um, I want, if I can, to go to Exhibit 147. Any objection? I move to introduce you. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No objection. All right. Admit Exhibit 147 to evidence. It's up on your screen now. What is this? Yeah, this is an email exchange be between me and Mr. Nate Paul. Well, how did it come about that you and Mr. Nate Paul were having email exchanges I, about? I, I, I don't know because it came, for me, came out of the blue. Um, He's in this email, he's asking to meet with me in person. As I testified to earlier, I had never met Mr. Paul. I've never talked to him on the phone. Um, at some point in July, I became aware of him. That must have been through the attorney general uh, who would have alerted to me about, right. about him. All right. So now this is dated on July the 17th, is it not? It is. Do you have any idea why uh, Mr. Paul would feel so so comfy asking you for an appointment that he's calling you Jeff. If you neither one of you have ever met each other, I, I can only speculate. Were you aware by that time he was friends with the attorney general? I, I don't know if I knew what the extent of the relationship was. I knew they had a relationship by then. I think. And so this uh, this idea that he would you would talk to him on the seventeenth, uh, what was your three or four word three word answer? Um. Remember, I'm Baptist, so it was I'm not available. All right. And why did you say you were not available? Well, I knew at this time that there was litigation involving Mr. Paul. I mean, I, I, I would have known that, and it would not be my practice to meet with someone who's represented by counsel who is, I mean, they're not, it, it's an, it, it, an right. opposing party. It's just they're involved in litigation that the state is involved in. That, that would just, I mean, it. Beyond that, as a lawyer, that's, I mean, you just don't do things like that. Well, to put it another way, 
You guys were in litigation with Mr. Paul as one of the parties. Would you ever meet with him without his lawyer? Well, we had intervened into a lawsuit. Right. And so we were, I mean, we were in the middle of the V, so to speak. All right. So is that why you so told him you would not talk to him? That is right. All right. Now, um, I want, if I can, I'm going to, well, let's, uh, let's go now, if we can, to Exhibit 87. This last one we just looked at was July uh, the 18th, right? You remember that? July 17th and 18th, Any correct. Objection? Right? Hearsay, Your Honor. This document is hearsay. Well, I, I wasn't filled with the question. Let's just, the doc, the, I haven't asked him, I haven't asked to admit it yet. Uh, I will. Well, I just thought he had forgotten, but. So the, docu the two documents are, one is July 18th and the one you're being shown now is July 22nd, is that correct? I'm, I'm not seeing it yet, but I do know I did That's a memo a to the point. file on July All 22nd. Right. Let me just walk up with you, show you the hard copy to identify it. It's not in evidence yet, so don't testify from it. Okay. okay. Without testifying to the contents, uh, tell me whether you recognize that as a memo of yours. Mr. Hardy, give me a moment. I want to look through this. Sir. Give me a moment. I want to read through this on his sure. objection. Are you submitting it? Not yet. Okay. I will, I, but not yet, if that's okay. Did, okay. Did, did the court have something on your mind you wanted to? Move on. Thank you. Um, that uh, I want to ask you now, back on that earlier email, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul asked you for a meeting on a particular date, did he not? Right, I think he wanted to meet the the following week, that, that, that Monday. Well, that's due, that's due for the record and, and the court real quickly. July 17th, let's go back if we could to 147, Stacy. Yeah, I'm seeing it. That memo says, does it not? Or go ahead and read it out loud for the jury. Yeah, it says, I hope all is well. Are you available for an in-person meeting on Monday? Which right. would have been the 20th, I believe. Well, that, let's, yeah, that, that's what I want to do. Let's figure out the dates for the jury. Up above, we know when you said I'm not available, it was July 18th on Saturday, correct? So Monday would have been the 20th of July, is that correct? That is correct. Did you later discover there was any significance uh, to meeting on Monday in terms of anything else that was supposed to happen that week? Well, I, I found out on the morning of July 22nd that there was a hearing I involving the Mitty Foundation case. And on, on July the 22nd, that would have been a Wednesday, would it not? That would have been Wednesday, yes, sir. What time that day did you find out that there was a hearing uh, scheduled for that day? It, it must have been pretty early because I normally arrived at the office 7, 7.15. And I got a call that morning before I left for the office from Darren McCarty. Did, did you later go back, Mr. Mateer, and figure out that the meeting Mr. Paul wanted on Monday the 20th concerned this hearing on the, on the 22nd? I, I believe that was the case. All right. But not having met with him on the 20th, until you got to the office that morning or whenever you were contacted, were you aware before the morning of the 22nd that there was a hearing scheduled for that day? I was not aware. How did you become aware of that hearing? Yeah, Mr. McCarty, the deputy for civil litigation, called me, and I remember being at my condo um, in downtown Austin. Again, had to have been sometime in the six o'clock hour, uh, and he had advised me. Objection, hearsay. Yeah, 
he, he's certainly okay. right. It is. So, after what did you and 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 the others become concerned about what was about to happen, what was about to be proposed that morning? I was concerned that the attorney general was going to appear in Travis County District Court and argue a motion on behalf of the Office of Attorney General. Well, why would that concern you? Well, I mean, at the time, I couldn't remember a, a, a sitting attorney general actually going into a, a district court to argue anything. I mean, the last one was probably Dan Morales. Uh, what was your fear? Uh, my, my, I mean, General Paxson has wo some wonderful qualities, but he is not a litigator. And, and to think that, that he would go into court arguing a motion just, just made absolutely n no sense, and especially on a matter, I mean, this isn't the Google case. This wasn't a Supreme Court argument. This was, with all respect to those who practice in Travis County District Court, it was Travis County District Court. All right, Mr. Mateer, as a result of your concern, did you organize a meeting? I, I did organize a meeting that morning. That's all I'm asking right now. All right, and, and who all did you have at that meeting? Well, I, I had Mr. Paxton, uh, and I had Blake Brickman, and I had Mark Rylander, who was the deputy of communications. Okay, and uh, at that meeting, what was your intent for that meeting initially? I, I mean, I wanted to find out what Mr. Paxton was thinking, because, I mean, just, it was inconceivable to me that he would want to go to district court to argue something. Did you know at that time on whose behalf the argument would have in effect been? I think, Mr. McCarty, I would have, yes, I would have known. And who was that? Well, it would have been, it would have been in the Mitty Foundation at the urging of Mr. Paul. All right, and when you, when you had the meeting, before you started talking about other things with the Attorney General, what did you discover in terms of whether somebody had changed his mind? Well, I, I did learn that actually Mr. Paxton, that Mr. McCarty was successful in, in having the Attorney General not go to that hearing. He, he was persuaded not to go. So then what did, you move, what did you move that meeting of July the 22nd, what subject did you move it to? What's, well, it had to involve Nate Paul. I mean, just that the Attorney General being involved in matters like the Mitty Foundation, things, again, that were not significant litigation matters at the Office of Attorney General. By that time, and by talking to other deputies and information, had you cons become concerned about the Attorney General's relationship with Nate Paul? I was starting to become concerned. So during that meeting, did you take any position and urge him in any way concerning Nate Paul? Objection, hearsay. And also, it's privileged, Your Honor. I think, I think what we're about to have, uh, yes, Move on. what I'm about to offer, Your Honor, uh, is uh, party admissions by a party opponent, comments that Mr. Paxton made in that meeting is the reason for it. And I think that comes in under admission by the party opponent. Move on. Sure. You said move on? Move on. Okay. Now, in that meeting, did you yourself make any particular urging of the Attorney General. Objection, hearsay, Just and answer. also privilege. Object on both grounds. I haven't asked him for the statement. Overruled. Thank you. Did you? I did. And what did you urge him as it regarding Nate Paul? Again, Your Honor, this is hearsay, and also it's him advising the Attorney General, which is privileged communication. First of all, the Attorney General is not here, and he doesn't have the right to claim an attorney-client privilege. There is no personal attorney-client privilege for him this. The only question would be as to whether the Attorney General's office had the right to invoke it, and I respectfully suggest they did not. Overruled, move along. Thank you. So, <coughs> what did you urge him? I urged him not to have any further dealings with Nate Paul, to let the lawyers, the professionals in the Office of Attorney General handled these matters as they saw fit. What was the Attorney General's response? He committed to that. Objection, hearsay. Also, it's a communication, Your Honor. I think this comes out of the party admission, Your Honor. This is, uh, I think, clearly admissible. In, in terms of uh, the Attorney General, uh, these are, he's a party, and, and this is an admission being offered as admission by him. 
of rule. Go ahead. The, the, the attorney general committed to me with Mr. Rylander and Mr. Brickman in the room that he would have no further dealings, that he would allow the office, the professionals in the office, to handle the matter. How long was this meeting that y'all were in? I, I guess a 30 minutes or so, maybe 45 minutes. Now I'm asking you demeanor and manner as opposed to actual words. How would you describe how insistent you were in your urging of him to have no more contact with Mr. Paul? It was very troubling to me that the Attorney General would be willing to appear in Travis County District Court. So I, I was very concerned that why he would want to do that when we have, again, 800 attorneys at the Office of Attorney General who are very capable. My question is, how insistent were you? I was pretty insistent. Obviously, you recognize he had the right to talk to anybody or help anybody, you thought, right? Well, and I wanted in this meeting, that's why I, I had Mark Rylander there. Because Mark Rylander, his title was dec Director of Communications, but the, the joke in the office was I was first assistant and he was first friend. All right, so in this meeting, how would you describe the demeanor or earnestness or lack of or whatever? the Attorney General's outward response when he told you he would not do it anymore. He seemed sincere to me. When you left that meeting, what did you believe in terms of the Attorney General's conduct in the future or contact or attempts to help Mr. Paul? I was hopeful that he would allow the professionals in the Office of Attorney General to do their jobs and he wouldn't be involved anymore. All right. Were you surprised to discover later that the very next day he's contacting other assistants on other matters to help Mr. Paul? Surprised and disappointed, yes. All right, during the time from July the 22nd, from then on, after his assurance that he would not have nothing more to do with Mr. Paul, did you become aware that his contacts with Mr. Paul had become even more frequent? I did. Did you become aware that those contacts that were more, much more frequent also touched a broader variety of activities? I did. And yes. just charity? Yes. Okay. At this time, uh, Your Honor, I will move to introduce uh, what my number was. I don't have it here. The number of the last exhibit. Can Is I that number 87? Yeah. Exhibit 87. Thank you. Admit it. We, we object, first off, hearsay, Your Honor. Second off, it's clearly, he's, he even expressed concern for the Attorney General. That was his client. This talks about communications between client and lawyer. This is a privilege issue, square and away. I already admit it. I already admit it. 87. Overruled. Now, I wonder, if I could, um, I want to ask you to move on to another exhibit. But let me ask you something before I go there. Um, that meeting was on the 22nd, and I apologize. I think when you're uh, talking, I may be dropping my voice some here. I'm hoping people in the back can still hear, but let me, let me make sure they can at this tone of voice. And I, um, did you ultimately respond to back where you and I were before uh, to anyone about the particular request that had been made of you by Mr. Paul to meet back on that Monday? Remember, on the, on the 17th, he asked to meet you on a, the 20th, correct? Mm -hmm. I, th I think at some point, Mr. Paul's lawyer sent me either a letter or an email, um, which I respond to, again, I think by email. All right. What I want to do is, let me, if I may step over briefly, if I may have your permission to get the number.
ask you, uh, I'm going to come up and give you a copy of it so that you can look at the picture. Thank you. Uh, I've been corrected by somebody who knows much more than I. I really should be talking about 161. It's the same document, but I gave it the wrong number. In my, in my questions. Now. You have it? Stella. Stella, did we? Stella, excuse me. Did we give him one? Army, if we can just find one in another book. I'll give him mine until we get it. But, uh, Mr. Hardy, you want? I'd look at it. Do you need it? I think I'd remember it. Here's what I'm asking. Now that you've had a chance to look at 161, does that refresh your memory as to when you then responded to his request to have met back on the 20th? It, yes, it does. All right. And when did you, we've gone through the meeting on July 22nd. You've had the conversation we heard about with the Attorney General. And then now you've moved back uh, to July 24th, two days after the meeting with the Attorney General, correct? Correct. Right. And so then did you sit down and draft a memo uh, and respond, rather, uh, to uh, whom? Well, to Mr. Paul's lawyers. And actually, I didn't really know who they were at this time. And so I was asking for information so I could adequately respond. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here's what I wanted to do. The reason I stopped about giving the name, I wanted you to give it. At the time you received a letter from Mr. Paul, did you even know who his lawyer was? I, I did not or didn't remember. All right. So then when you checked around, did you become familiar with whom you were going to be talking to? I, I did. And who was that? Well, I, I probably, I, sitting here, I don't remember. I know Mr. Wynn was one of his lawyers. All right. Well, that, actually, let me just ask you and focus on that. Did you become aware that a Mr. Michael Wynn was representing him in some matters? I, I did in, in, during that time period, and, yes. and regardless of who he was, had you, by the time of the 24th, looked at the history of correspondence with Mr. Paul in terms of the way he talked to your people? I mean, he attached... In, 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 in his email to me, he attached. Is this the email? Excuse me. Is this the email back on the 17th? Um, I think it's an e a later email. All right. And what did he attach for you? He attached correspondence that he had with primarily Mr. Godby, and in and, and which he's complaining to Mr. Godby. What, exactly. Was he complaining about the treatment he was getting in the Mitty Foundation lawsuit from Mr. Godby? Yes. Was he complaining that he kept writing Mr. Godby, he the party, writing the lawyer for the other side? Was he complaining in constant emails about Mr. Godby? That's exactly what he was doing, yes, sir. And Mr. Godby, because he's not supposed to talk to a represented person, had done what? He, I, he had not responded, which would be what any lawyer would do. You don't respond to the client or the, of the potential opposing party, you respond to their lawyers. When you looked at the letter uh, or actually when you were getting ready to write him on the 24th, did you have occasion to review that, that correspondence? I did, yes. And uh, that's why I moved, if I could, Your Honor, to 161. I moved to introduce any, 161. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. This privilege issue keeps coming up. As you can see on the document itself, it says, this is attorney work product communication regarding a pending litigation matter. I mean, it's labeled as such. And, and I would suggest to the court that all of these types of emails are, in fact, 
work product or attorney-client privilege communications, and the only individual in that office who holds that privilege and who can waive that privilege is the elected attorney general. <laughs> I, I have to, I'm sorry for laughing. I have to, yeah. So this is when sometimes we might take positions that come back to bite us. This is actually his exhibit that we agreed to pre-admit. And so I am offering an exhibit that it was pre-admitted by us to him because it was one of his exhibits. Well, I, well hold on. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how he can now turn around and make a bunch of objections to an exhibit that he agreed to pre-admit. Do we agree to pre-admit and he accepted? It's his pre-admitted exhibit. It's in evidence is my point. I, I'm very confused because um, that was very confusing, but I would suggest this to the court. They marked, they put 161 on this as if it was their exhibit and moved it into evidence and you asked for my objection. Yes. 161 on their exhibit list is not this. Uh, so, I mean, I'm trying to, first I guess we need to figure out what exhibit he's actually trying to offer. And if he's really trying to offer this, it ain't the right number. And if it's, he's offering something that's already in evidence, then obviously I wouldn't object to it. But I'm very confused about what he's trying to do. The court is very confused too. Uh, I, I wish, I wish, I, I'm still, I, I suggest he talked to, like I did, talk to someone on his side that knows more than he does about this. If he notices that exhibit that we introduced is AG 161. That's the Attorney General 161. I think if he checks with his people, he's going to find that's their exhibit that we agreed to pre-admit. I didn't have any discussions with Mr. Harden. I mean, I know he's accused me of being uh, recalcitrant. I haven't had any discussions about the exhibits, but my colleague, uh, Dan Cogdale, has. As I understood it, they weren't going to object to any exhibits that we offered. They have no objections. But we certainly, we had exhibits on our list that we may not offer. So I think that's probably what the dilemma we have, but I'm going to turn it, if you don't mind, since, since I didn't talk to Mr. Harden personally, maybe Mr. Cogdale can, can enlighten I, I, me. I again suggest he talks to someone who knows something about the subject. I, I've just been handing my Ms. Jarris, and I'll be glad to attend her to the court, where they have written down their exhibit number in this. 161. That, that might be true, but you need to let us know you're offering our exhibit. I mean, that, when you say 161, that presupposes you're offering your exhibit 161. That's why we looked on your list, and this ain't your exhibit 161. Now, with regard to whether these were pre-admitted or not, I would turn it on to uh, Mr. Cogdale. In, in light of him objecting to us at this extended time, this may be the first time I'm asking the court to take that in consideration. They've been objecting to their own exhibit. Mr. Cogdale. Judge, in my conversations with Ms. Revorka, both... Speak into the microphone, please. Yes, in my conversations, and I understand Mr. Harden's heartburn that he didn't object to ours and we're objecting to his, I get that. That notwithstanding, in my conversations, both orally and in email exchanges with Ms. Revorka, I very clearly stated that while I appreciate they're not objecting, all we did not intend to offer all of our exhibits. Many of our exhibits were marked for identification purposes only, for impeachment, for whatever. So I never said, just because you didn't object to them, we, we, we want to offer them all. That never happened. I, I think we may be raising game and chip to a new level. The fact is, it is their exhibit. They asked if we would agree to pre-admit. We agreed to pre-admit. That put it in evidence. It's, it's as simple as that. No, it doesn't. Just because they didn't object to it, that somebody has to offer it. We never said all our exhibits that we marked are coming in. We never said that. I never said that. I get his heartburn, but I ne it, I'm happy to pull the email up in my, my exchange with Ms. Brevorka, but I clearly said in there, we do not intend to offer all of our exhibits that have been marked. I'm glad we don't have to poll the kids in the, in the um, upstairs as to what they think about this exchange. We've now used about eight or nine minutes, I think, on a, them objecting to their own exhibit. I, I tender 161. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear Mr. Harden. I couldn't hear the last part right. I'm sorry. I said, I'm glad that we do not have to poll the kids in the balcony as to whether this exchange makes any sense. I think we've taken about eight or nine minutes now on something that where y'all are objecting to your own pre-admitted exhibit. Again, 
they're not pre-admitted. They haven't been offered. We never said, if y'all don't object to them, we're offering all of them. To the contrary. I'm going to take a five-minute break. Thank you.
I need quiet in the courtroom, please.
Members, we're going to, uh, with a couple of issues to deal with, we've worked with both parties. They're going to work on the exhibits this evening, and then we're going to uh, deal with the privilege issue, uh, privilege issue uh, in the morning before we start trial. So we're going to adjourn for the day now. Um, you're to be back here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, which means in the dining room at, at uh, 8.45, ready to walk out at 8.55.